Cornell University, Dartmouth College, Harvard University, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton University, Yale University. And this is the Ivy League Football Game of the Week. This week, Yale meets Pennsylvania at Franklin Field in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Ivy League football is brought to you by The Traveler. People responsive to people with insurance and financial service needs. The Traveler, where fairness is good business. GTE, a leader in advanced telecommunications, electronics, lighting, and many other industries around the world. American Brands, Inc., a group of related packaged goods and service companies whose brand names have become household bywords. American Express, cards, traveler's checks, and vacation stores. American Express, don't leave home without us. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Galliot at Franklin Field, Philadelphia, on a glorious afternoon for Ivy League football. It's homecoming here at Penn, and a crowd in excess of 40,000 is on hand to see the Bulldogs of Yale and their three-game winning streak go against the Quakers of Penn in their 3-0 Ivy League record. There's a lot of excitement in the air because it's homecoming weekend here at Penn. And Sean McDonough would like to share a little of that excitement with you as he saw it last night. Homecoming at Ivy and other schools around the nation is a time of nostalgia, reunions, rekindling of friendships, and celebration. At Penn, it all starts here at Superblock in the shadow of a superb sculpture called the Covenant. From here, the route winds its way down the Locust Walk, past fraternity houses and classroom buildings, with the band and the crowd making their way to Hill Field. We wanted to take a look and show you the route through this handsome campus. We saw students and faculty making their way on this major campus thoroughfare. Then last night we returned for the pep rally. It was a happy milling throng for indeed the band was there and the cheerleaders. Penn President Sheldon Hackney. This is going to be a great time. It's been a very nice day. The trustees have been here on campus for the last few days, and you'll see a lot of alumni sort of trickling onto the campus in the next 24 hours and around tomorrow. So if you see strange people, smile at them, please. Make sure keep your tuition down. Athletic Director Charles Harris. The game tomorrow is at 1 o'clock. Come early. But let me also ask you to be good fans. We do have a lot of friends here visiting us. This will be the largest crowd at Pennsylvania in at least 20 years. Let's show them what first-class fans are all about all the way around. And Coach Jerry Burns. Homecoming 1984. Who in the world would have thought four years ago when we all came here, talking about the seniors particularly, that we would be playing for our third consecutive Ivy League championship. <laughs> Who would have thought four years ago that we would, we would be playing in Franklin Field 1984 homecoming in front of 40,000 people. And after the speeches, the crowd did march down to Hill Field to the roaring bonfire and the happy antics of the cheerleaders. After that, a lot of this crowd made its way to Pat Ryan's Smokey Joe's, a favorite campus watering place where fans and players gather before Saturday's games. And that's a little glimpse of what it was like here on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania last night.
There's no national ranking at stake in this football game this afternoon between Penn and Yale, but first place in the Ivy League means as much to Yale and Penn as it does national ranking. Penn is 3-0, undefeated in Ivy League play. Yale is riding a three-game winning streak coming in here this afternoon in Franklin Field. They are 2-1 in Ivy League play. Some questions, however. Yale is not entirely healthy. Is that going to affect them? And how will the heat affect either side of the ball this afternoon for either Penn or for Yale? Penn goes, without a doubt, is the team with more depth. To explain more fully the game situation this afternoon, our color commentator, Upton Bell. Thank you, Dick. I don't think it'll take too much to put this game in perspective. After the hoopla last night and all the things that go on on the campus, the most important thing to Penn today is that Yale has a new quarterback. He played last week. His name is Mike Series, number 11. He threw three touchdown passes, but it was against Columbia. Today, he's going to go against the best defense in all of the Ivy League, the quickest defense, and I think he's going to have a real problem. Also, as far as the heat is concerned, it must be almost 90 degrees down there on the field on an artificial turf. I think it will hurt probably Yale more than it will Penn, although both sides will be tired. And finally, the Penn offense behind John McGee and their quarterback. I think they'll look early to go over top on a Yale defense that has trouble with man-to-man -man coverage. All those things are a factor, but in the end, can an inexperienced quarterback overcome the best defense in the Ivy League? I say no. We might point out, however, that that inexperienced quarterback, Mike Sear, for his performance a week ago, earned Ivy League Player of the Week honors. And down on the sideline throughout the afternoon to bring us up to date on what's happening with some color and excitement from there is Sean McDonough. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Throughout today's telecast, you're going to be seeing shots of the Penn cheerleaders and their mascots, so we thought right away we'd let you meet them. Say hello. Hi, my name is Abby Cohen. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm a sophomore. Hi, I'm Tommy Sandler from White Plains, New York, and I'm also a sophomore. Hi, I'm Kelly Brennan. I'm from Rochester, New York, and I'm a sophomore. Hi, I'm Carl Law. I'm from Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I'm a sophomore. Hello, I'm Michelle Griffith, and I'm from Teaneck, New Jersey, and I'm a sophomore. Hi, Charlie Crawford from Darien, Connecticut. I'm a senior. Hi, I'm Irene Finn, and I'm a junior from Lanham, Maryland. Hi, I'm Stephen Marcus. I'm a senior from I'm Wellesley, Wellesley, Massachusetts. Hi, I'm Jennifer Weiss. I'm a junior from Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm Scott Wolf. I'm a sophomore from Miami, Florida. All right. I'm Rosemary Mikulski. I'm a junior from Bucks County. Hi, my name is Brad Bovey. I'm a senior from Malvern, Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Monica Sanders, a sophomore from Abington, Pennsylvania. I'm Wayne Fursky. I'm a senior from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Hi, I'm Art Silverman, a junior from Miami, Florida. Yeah. They come from all over, and they're certainly ready for this afternoon's big matchup. A moment ago, we talked about some of the key players you'll be watching this afternoon. Of course, for Yale, it is that quarterback, Mike Sear, out of Totowa, New Jersey, a senior who has had not much playing time until just a week ago when he threw those three touchdown passes. He wears number 11. He's a spunky guy, and he says he doesn't even think about the years that preceded this. He is just content with what he has done a week ago and what he would hope to do this afternoon. They're on a pitch back to Mike Stewart. Stewart, the second quarterback, and now fires to Mike Luzzi, the leading receiver of Yale, the wingback. Also this afternoon, you'll be looking at number 31, Rick Coase. There's a real family split on this one because Rick's father went to the University of Pennsylvania. And now Rick Coase, number 31, is a stalwart at the tailback position for the Eli offense. And then out of nowhere this season came a young sophomore out of California by the name of Ted McCauley. We'll be watching him throughout the day. Pennsylvania as well has their star. I think looking on the Penn side, we have some interesting players starting out with the quarterback, John McGeehan, who really is probably the all Ivy League quarterback this year. He really can bomb. He throws to his tight end, Lyle Hennigan, a lot. He's the type of guy that can scramble. He'll put awful pressure on the defense of Yale and will be a real problem today, I think, to contain. Also, you're going to talk about to Steve Ortman. We'll start out now again with John McGeehan. On offense, he's your quarterback, probably one of the best in the league, using play action. He's going to hit Lal Hennigan, the all-Ivy tight end, on the sideline for a touchdown. That's a tough play to stop, tough tight end to stop. Also, at the tailback position, you'll see on the toss, Mr. Ortman. A lot of people believe that Steve Ortman is the real reason that this club is where they are right now because of the many things he can give them. Also, the outstanding sophomore running back in the Ivy League, Rich Camizio, runs inside and outside and might be the key to this game today for Penn on offense.
And now introducing the starting defensive lineup for Yale University at defensive left end number 55, Dean Yakabuchi. At defensive left tackle number 84, Pat Maloney. At middle guard for Yale number 69, John Zaneski. At defensive right tackle, number 79, Mark Dellinger. At defensive end, number 81, Bob Keenan. At outside linebacker, number 40, Carmen Alakwa. Inside linebacker, number 56, Ardell McKenna. At monster back, number 49, Tony Rush. At cornerback, number two, Tim Kotkevich. At safety, number 39, Mike Jarkson. At cornerback, number 46, Steve Pender. And the head coach of Yale University, Carm Koza, and the rest of the football team. Introducing now the University of Pennsylvania offensive lineup. At split end, number 85, Warren Bueller. At left tackle, number 78, Ed Foley. At left guard, number 57, Jeff Goyette. At center, number 56, Joe Smalis. At right guard, number 62, Tom Galley. At right tackle, number 74, Matt Petronio. At tight end, number 80, co-captain Lau Hennigan. At quarterback, number 14, John McGeehan. At fullback, number five, Mike O'Neill. At tailback, number 32, Steve Ortman. At wide receiver, number 34, Jim O'Toole. The head coach of the University of Pennsylvania football team, Jerry Burton. Productions have been concluded. This air of excitement continues and just permeates throughout Franklin Field. We have the officials at midfield and getting ready for the flip of the coin. Our officials today, the referee is Anthony Chambers. The umpire is Kenneth Luciani. The head linesman, Vincent Rosso. The line judge is Michael Simons. The field judge, David Walker. The back judge, Nicholas Trainer. And the clock operator is John Crowther here at the game between Yale and Penn this afternoon.
big dick, uh, one of the things that Penn has to be very careful of after losing to Army last week and coming back and playing in the conference, while actually Yale played Columbia last week and won, really stopped the touchdown the last minute or so to save the game for themselves, Yale must win. On the other hand, Penn is looking forward to two weeks from now for what they think will be the Ivy League championship against Harvard here at uh, Franklin Field, but they've got to get by Yale first. They don't want to stumble on a team that probably is up very high because they're playing with a new quarterback and somebody that, yes, he got experience last week, Mike Sear, but this is the biggest game he'll probably ever play. Yale has won the toss. Yale has won the toss, and it'll be the University of Pennsylvania in the dark blue uniforms with the red numerals and the white trim kicking off to Yale in their visiting white uniforms. That's Tom Murphy, number one, who does the kicking for the University of Pennsylvania. The deep men for Yale will be number 10, Mike Luzzi, the wing back, and number 26, the sophomore sensation for Yale, Ted McCauley. This game is underway. McCauley at the 10. And McCauley returns it close to the 35-yard line with a flag on the play. Probably clipping. Taking a look at the Yale offensive line from left tackle to right tackle. Weimer, Andrew, Martinson, Wazlowski, and Squara. Yard on the defense. And there you heard on the return of the opening kickoff a face mask call against Pennsylvania. So Yale picks up additional yardage now. And the line of scrimmage they'll be starting from will be the 39-yard line as you look at the offensive backs and receivers for the Elis of Yale. Mike Sear, a senior from Totowar, New Jersey, who draws his second consecutive start for Yale, threw three touchdown passes against Columbia a week ago and earned Ivy League Player of the Week honor. Rick Coase gets the call, brought down at the 44-yard line. And leading that charge was Kevin Bradley, number 95, the co-captain for the University of Pennsylvania. I think we're going to see early that Yale might try and run at this Penn defense. It's been known to have a great ability from sideline to sideline to pursue, but maybe to try and get them a little on their backs by running straight at them. They certainly did it on the first one. Second down and five for Yale at the 44, their own. Dave Klein, the fullback, across the 45 to the 46-yard line where Dexter Desir, the nose tackle, a sophomore from Silver Springs, Maryland, makes the stop for Penn. Of course, when you do this, Dick, what you're doing is you're taking away that pursuit. And you're trying man-on-man -man blocking, and uh, maybe this is the one way to play Penn. You know, Columbia came out early and did this and was very successful until they had a couple of fumbles three weeks ago. Mike Sear told me yesterday they might try going underneath throwing against Penn early in the ball game. Yeah, with a third down and two, line of scrimmage is the 47-yard line, their own. Kevin Moriarty is out wide on the right side. the 45 with a head-on tackle and an out hit by outside linebacker number 20 Gavin O'Connor well he had the option that time to run or pass and he chose the wrong option he ran and I'll tell you Gavin O'Connor really waylaid him right at the line great play by O'Connor because he had a man for man now we'll be looking at Henry Eaton for the first time this afternoon that's Yale's punter he averages 39 yards a punt Kevin Bradley number 95 a co-captain all Ivy in a preseason All-America Tim Chambers back in single safety for the University of Pennsylvania around his 15-yard line. He is one of the leaders in the nation in that category. Eaton punt taken at the 10 by Chambers. Got some room. And goes down across the 27 to the 28-yard line as Mike Jarkson is in there on the tackle for Yale. Don't nope. think, I don't think I've ever quite seen a guy do so well with not great speed at picking his blockers and threading his way through that defense. One thing we're going to see, of course, this afternoon as we look at the Penn offensive box and receivers after that 43-yard punt, the offensive line for Penn, we are going to see a lot of backs for the University of Pennsylvania. They have a multitude of talent in that backfield as they line up in the eye on their first offensive play of the game from their own 28. And McGeehan wants to go for it all, looking for Jimmy O'Toole. He's got him. And on the first play of the game, it's going to be a 72-yard touchdown play. Fans, of course, have gone crazy. And why not? 
but we said at the top of the game that Penn might try go over top of Yale early because of their man coverage and they got it that time big six points early fine faking here by McGeehan as you can see he's got plenty of time to throw and he really unloads this cannon he's got single coverage the back he's got his back turned nowhere even near his man six points great catch by O'Toole but really a great throw and Murphy splits the uprights and just like that the University of Pennsylvania has a 7-0 lead over Yale in his key Ivy League game at Franklin Field before the homecoming crowd well somebody did a good job of scouting because Yale had had problems earlier this year as far as their coverage was concerned the thing that made the play was the play action fake by McGeehan and then it gave O'Toole time. In fact, it's funny about O'Toole, this is the first time he started. He was really their starting wide receiver last year, finally got his opportunity after being injured, stepped in in front of Warren Bueller. First play from scrimmage today, not bad. That's also his first touchdown of this season. And we had talked to head coach Jerry Byrne earlier. You have to win the games that you're supposed to win, and you should win, and you can win. Yale has uh, defeated three teams, uh, and, and they played well. They built up confidence, their confidence. That concerns me. It's not who they played. It's the fact that they have a three-game winning string, com string coming in here. And Luzzi takes it at the goal line for Yale, and Luzzi starts upfield. Luzzi can't get by Ross Armstrong, and Ross Armstrong drives him out of bounds at the 35-yard line. So, Pennsylvania had the ball only 11 seconds, and the defending Ivy League champions have themselves seven points on the scoreboard, and Yale goes back to work once again. John McGeehan really laid the ball out there. Beautiful pass. And you can see a slight celebration in the end zone, but boy, I'll tell you that psychologically, that really hurts a team to get down like that. The other team having the ball for only 11 seconds. Rick Coase, and he is nailed in that backfield, is coming through there is Tom Gilmore, the defensive left tackle. He's 6'2", 225 pound, a computer math major at Penn. And they think he can add pretty well, like he did that time. He is their best defensive lineman. Now, not only the defense uh, have fired up, you see the plays, the scoring drive, of course, didn't take long. Sure did took it? a lot of time, didn't it? Yep. <laughs> Second down and 11, as Yale lost a yard on that play. Line of scrimmage is now the 34-yard line. They put... Moriarty wide on the right side, and they're split wide on the left side as well. Incomplete. Vince Morata's in the Yale lineup, number 22, at a wingback position. He hasn't seen too much action this season for the Eli's. So it is third down and 11 coming up on the incompleted pass. We have not yet had four minutes played in this first quarter from Franklin Field in Philadelphia. Defense loves when they're in this situation. You know they're going to tee off. They know that Yale is, is probably going to throw the football, and this gives them an opportunity to rush the passer straight up. And here come those linebackers into the slot. Looks like we had some movement along the line by Yale. Looked like Quinlan, the number 40, 14, who just caught the ball, was offside. And we have the flag on the play as John Chismar was in there to make the tackle on Quinlan. Earlier, of course, we talked to head coach Carm Koza of Yale. All right, he's a senior. He's not very big, but he is quick. He does put a little bit of velocity on the ball. He can let it go, and, and we think that, uh, uh, you know, he'll do a good job for us. He did a good job for us last week to win it with uh, just a few minutes left. He went and took his 92 yards. And, of course, head coach Carm Koza was talking about his quarterback, Mike Sear, who is starting in place of Mike Curtin. What's the matter with Mike Curtin? Mike Curtin has a Charlie horse that, that was uh, bleeding and just did not heal properly enough to play in this game this afternoon. The penalty marked off, illegal Motion. procedure. Still third. Sounds like he was a quarterback at one time. Third down and 16 yards to go. Anthony Chambers, our referee today. Moriarty split wide on the left and Luzzy wide on the right. Pressure. Over the middle, complete to Andy Marudi, and he is brought down immediately. With not too much room to uh, pick up on that play. So in the lineup for Penn and making that hit 
Jerry McFadden over there quickly. They'll give you those plays all day long. Why not? You want to throw underneath and they've got you up down seven to nothing? They'll let you have those five, six yard passes. Fourth down now, so Yale's had the ball two times here, and two times they have been forced into a punting situation. The line of scrimmage is the 34. Hank Eaton, Yale's punter, standing on his 21. Great punt. 49 yard punt as Chambers starts up here. Chambers returns it to the 28 yard line. And that's where Penn will go to work. Ardell McKenna downfield to make the tackle. I wonder if Tim Chambers ever took any ballet lessons. I've never seen a guy so nimble. Two people had him hemmed in there. And again, quickness has nothing to do with speed. Just sidestepped two guys and got five or six more he yards got, out. Probably, probably got that nimbleness. He's one of 12 children, you know, dancing around that uh, dinner table. Maybe there's no dinner. First and 10, Penn at the 27. Eaton, 48-yard punt. That's Ortman who gets the call and picks up good yardage to the 35-yard line where he is hit by Carmen Alacqua. We can say it now, Upton, you and I found out late yesterday afternoon that Carmen Alacqua yells fine outside linebacker playing with a very painful shoulder bruise that occurred in practice this week and aggravated an earlier season injury. Penn second down and two. O'Toole in motion. And it's complete out into the flat, and who loses the shoe? <laughs> Rush made the tackle, and O'Toole lost the shoe. First down for Penn. O'Toole lost the shoe on this. We're going to take a look at it. He's almost caught McGee, and nice roll here by the defensive lineman. Zinniski almost gets a hold of McGee and McGee gets the ball off to O'Toole and O'Toole gets the shoe off his foot but the pass is completed for a four yard game. Why not? And the first down at the 38 yard line. Steve Ortman again across that 45 to the 46 yard line. He tripped up by Carmen Alacqua the outside line. Stepped right back up in it and made, well, this is an interception, made bubble recovery. This is a real break for Yale, and they better really take advantage of this one because I have a feeling that Penn is going to control the football most of the day. A break early, maybe they can get themselves on the board and change the tenor of this game. The first down at the 43-yard line of Penn. Rick Coase gets the call up the middle inside the 40 to the 37-yard line. Now Yale needs desperately to be able to capitalize on the break here that they have picked up for themselves as Denton Walker made the tackle. You have good field position as they do now, Dick. I think the best way to take advantage of Penn and the only way is do what they're doing and the only thing they've been doing well, which is run straight at them. Take their quickness away. Second down and five at the 38-yard line. Collision in the backfield, all kinds of problems. And Kevin Bradley puts an end to the play very quickly as Sear and Dave Klein collided in that backfield. That's the problem with the guy, even though he has one game under his belt playing as a defense like this, they were anxious. It was just a straight handoff to Klein out of the eye, running again straight at him, but this time they ran into each other. An inexperienced quarterback handing off to a guy that has, he has not been doing it to all year long, at least in a game. This is Yale's third attempt at a third down conversion of the ball game here in the first quarter. Yale has been unsuccessful in their first two attempts. They trail 7-0, and we have a flag on the play. Attack too much time on top of it. Illegal procedure on the offense. 
Yale having their problems getting untracked. And their biggest problem, of course, is not being able to move football forward after picking off and recovering the fumble. But they've been their own worst enemy. They, on first down, they got themselves five yards. Second down, the quarterback ran into the fullback. And third down, too much time. And third down now is with 13 yards to go. The line of scrimmage, the 46. Mike Luzzi completed the 40, but far short of the first down. As Pisano over there quickly to uh, cover on the play. Down and seven for the Elis. Be punting for the third time this afternoon. Seven oh three left to go in this first quarter. Eaton standing on his own forty two yard line. Line of scrimmage is the forty. Aims for that coffin corner. But it's going to make the end zone instead, and so the touchback, the ball will be brought out to the 20-yard line where Penn will go to work with a 7-0 lead here in the first quarter as the result of a 72-yard touchdown pass play from John McGeehan to Jim O'Toole on the first offensive series of the game for Penn. Pennsylvania comes into the ball game, of course, with that 4-1 overall record, 3-0 in the Ivy League, undefeated, sharing that undefeated spot in the Ivy along with Harvard. Stan Koss, the fullback, number 26, picks up a couple of yards. He's hit there by Carmen Alacqua. That'll be about second down and eight yards to go for the first down for Penn. Line of scrimmage, the 22-yard line. As Penn comes out of the huddle, they put Pat Bueller, the wide receiver, out there on the right side. They line up in the eye. Sean Shoulder, number 82, the tight end, shifts to the right side. Second down and seven. That's Rich Camizio, very close to the first down. Tony Resch, the monster back for Yale, makes the tackle on Camizio, the sophomore out of New Fairfield, Connecticut. We asked John McGinn how important another Ivy League title is to him. Oh, very important. It's uh, especially this year, being our senior year. You know, we came in uh, our sophomore year, and uh, you know, I wasn't too much of a part of it that year. I was excited about it and everything. And and last year was fun, and but this year we want to win it outright. You know, and and last year I think we kind of, even though we we got to share the title, we lost to Harvard, and uh, and that didn't feel quite right to us. We want to win it outright this year. On the third and seventh play, the line of scrimmage is the 30-yard line. Good enough for the first down after Ardell McKenna had made the tackle, but not strong enough for soon enough to stop Penn on that first down attempt. It's funny what a 72-yard uh, scoring play will do in the very beginning of the game because Penn has really loosened up that Yale defense. They seem indecisive, and as a result, they're blowing them off the line of scrimmage. First down at their own 30. Handing in the tight end on the right side. Again wants to go to work again. He goes deep again, looking for Warren Bueller, and Bueller makes the catch, and there's a flag on the play. Scott Kevich went down with him, but Warren Bueller, number 85, the senior out of Glen Rock, New Jersey, it's who got, is the deep got threat. The interference of the I formation. He fakes to both backs, then he semi-rolls to his right, steps up in the pocket. Nice throw again by Bueller, who has beaten Katkavich. Katkavich, as you can see, with his right arm, interferes with Bueller. The flag goes down. They get the reception. Evidently, they can, they feel at will that they can pass deep on them. And that's, again, a, a key that we were talking about in the game. Penalty declined, by the way. Why not with the uh, yards they gain? They don't need the penalty. Interference was against Yale. Scott Kevich declined, of course, and they have the first down, Penn does, at the Yale 30-yard line. There you see O'Toole in motion to the right. Camisio gets the call as a flag is dropped. He might have been offside from the defensive side of the ball. We'll wait for the official call. Jarkson makes the tackle on Camisio. 
Well, Camisio yes, ran over Steve Penders, number 46, for Yale. Just ran Defense. right over. Offside. Oh, penalties against the Eli's have hurt them. And unable to move that ball offensively has also hurt them when they had the opportunity a moment ago on that fumble recovery. They trail seven to nothing. 4.50 to go in this first quarter from Franklin Field. Homecoming crowd of 40,000 on hand. Well, they're getting a real treat early. They've gotten some spectacular plays out of Penn. And again, defense to me wins for you. Penn's defense has been effective. Yale's has not. First and five at the 25. Gang tackle that pretty close to the line of scrimmage. Labissier leading the charge for Yale. Camisio to ball carrier. Camisio comes into the game today for Penn, the sophomore, with a 5.4 per carry average. Not bad for a sophomore, and he really probably is the sophomore of the year in the Ivy League. Not only can run outside, but he's so strong, and he's not that big. He's 5'9", 185 pounds. Second down and five at the 25. O'Toole in motion. Camisio gets the call again. Takes it inside the 20 to about the 17-yard line as Mike Jackson comes up from the safety position to make the tackle. It's another example of Camisio being able to run. He got a fine block from Steve Phelps, the right guard for Penn. But he steps right inside his block. Guard pulls. He comes in behind the guard, breaks his first tackle, and is finally dragged down, finally, by Jackson. And now with another first down, driving again at the 18-yard line of Yale. Camisio takes it to the 10-yard line. Bob Keenan there to ride him down. Camisio, a nice slashing-type runner. You don't hit him really head on. He immediately shifts the weight. That instinctive type of running that goes with fine backs. Well, the other thing that he does, he's a lineman's dream. Any lineman that has a back that not only follows their blocks, but is able to cut off, it makes it very easy. Just go the opposite way of the way the lineman takes the guy. Second down and three now for Penn at the 11 of Yale. Out quickly to O'Toole, and O'Toole, they say, trapped the football. Jarkson was covering on the play. O'Toole can do what he really wants after catching that first play of the game and going 72 yards with the score. He's entitled to let one drop. Well, I don't think Jerry Burton would agree with you, but I mean, if you want to be nice to the guy, that's your problem. 2.45 to go in this first quarter from Franklin Field. It is third down and three now for Penn at the 11-yard line of Yale. Again, decides to put Pat Bueller out wide on the left side. at the line of scrimmage. Looking for Sean Shoulder, the tight end, and Shoulder has it at the six-yard line as Tony Rush was over there to cover, but Shoulder. not until Shoulder picked up the first down. Sean Shoulder got his shoulder into this one. He's running to his left, McGee, and Shoulder makes a leaping catch. Rush is right on him, but the throw has to be perfect. Again, it's four for four. Don't jinx him. First and goal to go from the seven. Tool in motion. And Neil goes offside again. The stunting along there, Zaneski, pop before the snap of the ball across the neutral zone. Anticipation when you're mixing the run in the pass the way Penn has done so well in this first quarter. You Offside, keep play the defense. Well, that's half the distance of the goal line, and they're inside the five now. Really excited about the Penn football game, aren't they? As we've been on campus now, this is the second time we've been on this campus in a few weeks. You want to come back again? All right, enjoy coming here. You know that. They treat us very well. Good food. Excellent. Now it's first and goal to go from the three-yard line. Pennsylvania driving again. Right up the middle. Pat Bueller in motion to the right. The pitch to Camisio. He's still sliding, but he's short of the goal line. 
Dooley's in there. Jarkson's in there for Yale. Alakwa's in there for Yale. They all gang tackled him. Alakwa saved the play. It's a toss to Camizio. Alakwa comes right up, right in front of the defender, or right in front of the uh, blocker, and makes the play. Second down and goal to go from the two. The two goes out wide on the right side as they come out of the huddle. O'Toole in motion to the left. Dooley picks him up. A yep. little mix up in the backfield there, and the handoff, and there's no gain on the play. Ran right into Stan Cost, number 26. He must have been watching Sear. And Yakabuchi gets off the bottom, and Bob Keenan off the top for Yale. Camizio has four carries, 22 yards rushing in the ballgame in the first quarter with 57 seconds left to play in it. 7-0, pen out in front. Third down, goal to go from the two for Penn. Full house backfield. Now in motion. Alexic. Into the end zone, wide open, touchdown. Stan Ortman. Steve Ortman, rather, wide open. In the end zone for the score. This shows you what an old man in motion can do. Alexic went in motion. McGee and rolled to his left, and Ortman slipped out of the backfield. McGee is rolling to his left. He's making the defense come up. Right into the easy, easy. Take another look at it. This time he's rolling to his left. Gives him time to set. Throws two men around him, but not close enough to Ortman. They just spread the defense. Now Murphy. He splits the uprights for his 20th consecutive extra point, and Pennsylvania leads Yale 14 to nothing. Penn has a very well-balanced attack on both sides of the football. I think you're understating it. They got a terrific attack. And their defense really complements the offensive defense. When the offense had given up the ball once on a fumble to Yale, took the ball back away from them again, although Yale made a few mistakes. But I still say that, that an offense that is able to take the ball over in good field position, as Penn has been able to do all year long, whether it's Tim Chambers returning punts or kickoffs to set it up, or whether it's their deep game that sets them up, it just makes it very easy for them. And they kept a pretty good Yale team defensively guessing the whole first quarter. Murphy getting set to kick off, and Luzzi and McCauley are the deep men for Yale. Michael Luzzi, senior, hauls it in. It's up close to the 20-yard line, but he's immediately gang tackled down as the coverage downfield was quick for Pennsylvania. First guy to hit him was Tim Chambers. Uh, there, there is your best guy. There you look at the statistics for the scoring drive. Penn's second drive of the afternoon in the first quarter. Not bad, you're All-American defensive back, the first guy down on the kickoff. Not bad. Mike Sear at quarterback for Yale. Replacing the injured Mike Curtin, who is here but not dressed in football talks. Looking for Moriarty, who is covered and throws it out of bounds. Ross Armstrong going back there with him. Ross Armstrong is an all-Ivy sprinter. As you look at Mike Sear. I think Sean McDonough has some scores for us down on the field. You're absolutely right, Upton. Indeed, I do. Second quarter action, Wisconsin leads Ohio State in a mild upset thus far, 7 to nothing. Boston College leads Rutgers 14 to 7. At the half, it's Georgia 10, Kentucky nothing. Pitt leads Navy 21 to 7 in the second quarter. Maryland shutting out Duke 29 to nothing. That's also in the second quarter. And the play goes across the 25-yard line, close to that 26-yard line before Penn closes it down. Peter Gallagher, the outside linebacker, making the stop. Well, Yale has a third down and five coming up with the line of scrimmage, the 26-yard line. Three seconds, two seconds, one second. That is the end of the first quarter here at Franklin Field in Philadelphia with the score, Penn-14, Yale nothing. Take 
a look at the pan of the crowd who have to be very happy and the shirt sleeves will remind everybody it's probably almost 90 degrees on the field. And I guess on the field, Sean McDonough has some more scores. I hope he doesn't tell us Sheriff's Cruz is getting beaten again. Some more scores from around the country. Baylor leads TCU. That's 10 to 7, also in the second quarter. Oklahoma State shutting out Colorado 8 to nothing. That's in the second quarter. First quarter score, Michigan 7, Illinois nothing. Also in the first quarter, North Carolina State 10 and Clemson 7. We'll be keeping our eye on those games and much, much more around the country. Now back upstairs. And as we get ready for the first play of the second quarter with Penn leading 14-0, it is a third down and five for Yale with the line of scrimmage, their own 26-yard line. Yale wide on the left side with Kevin Moriarty. And Murata in a slot. picked off. That's Inskeep who almost picked that off. Rick Inskeep, a sophomore for Penn. Inskeep was going to keep it and go all the way. He just stepped right in front of him. Sierra's trying to get away from the pressure. And he has time to throw here. But watch number 17 of 37, Rick Inskeep, step right in front of the receiver. Hank Eaton standing on his own 13-yard line, and Tim Chambers back in single coverage at his own 40. Eaton gets a beauty. 47-yard punt as Chambers starts upfield. Brought down by the Eli kick coverage of Ardell McKenna getting down there very quickly. Penn is getting ready to probably bring some of their other people in. McGeehan had played so well in the first quarter. I would have to suspect that they're going to try and get another score and see if they can get some of the younger people in there. It is now first down and 10 at the 38-yard line. Penn with the football. Leading 14-0. Having things all their own way in this game so far. Complete out there to Pat Bueller. And Pat Bueller picks up the first down. Driven out by Pat Pettich. Getting some help from Tony Rex. It's a simple pass and by McGeehan. He two steps and he throws to his left. Bueller, who is out there all by himself. Petkovic left all alone. And when you have that type of situation, there's no way you can defend against that. Now, the next time, you got to be careful he doesn't fake out and down. Well, Penn picks up another first down. O'Toole goes in motion. McGeehan with a timely pitch back. And Stan Orton. Got Kevich in there quickly, and so is Jacobucci and McKenna. Quarterback McGeehan out of the eye. Nice fake here to the fullback. The toss to Ortman. Ortman's got a big hole. Sees it to the outside, runs into Kevich, but not after he got himself a first down. And again, driving. Pennsylvania driving. Don McGeehan directing the Pennsylvania attack. Comes out of the pocket nicely. Pat Bueller over there. And Bueller drives goes out of bounds at the 17-yard line. Driven out by Jarkson, the safety for Yale, but not until he's picked up another first down. The thing that impresses me is we will see here the way John McGeehan steps up in the pocket. He knows always where the pressure is coming from. He sees Bueller on the right side all alone, but the person who made the play was McGeehan stepping up and inside the pressure and finding the open man, Warren Bueller, number 83. Penn has nine first downs in the ball game, and Yale has none. 18-yard line at the line of scrimmage. Ortman is nailed behind the line of scrimmage by John Zaneski, the middle guard. Earlier this week, Jerry Burnt said he didn't know how he was going to block him because Zaneski's been outstanding all season long. Well, that's the first time that he hasn't been blocked, I can tell you, because mm -hmm. that's one of the few times that the Penn offense has been stopped for no gain. Second down, 11, no gain, and a yard loss. And that hasn't happened too many times. Second down and 11, line of scrimmage, the 19-yard line. Penn split on the left and slotted out there as well. Stan Ortman, ankle tackled by Zaneski. But Ortman picks up a few. 
If it wasn't for John Zaneski, number 69, we'll see him coming off his block. Steve Hortman would have been gone for six points. Great shoestring tackle here by Zaneski. No gain on the play, so it is third down and 11. The line of scrimmage remains the 19-yard line. He's out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Zaneski. Real hard-nosed football player. Engineering major at Yale. <laughs> O'Toole comes in motion to the right. And Cut Kevich breaks it up. Cut Kevich, number two for Yale. He's the one that saved the Columbia game for Yale last week on the last play of the ball game when he broke up an intended touchdown pass. McGeehan has plenty of time to throw. And he's looking for O'Toole right in behind Ketkavich, number two. Ketkavich makes really a nice play. O'Toole had gotten right in the middle of that defense, but now we're gonna see if they're gonna kick a field goal. Tom Murphy's out there, and he's six for nine in field goals this season. This will be a 36-yard field goal attempt. Certainly has the distance. And right through the uprise for a 36-yard field goal for 10, and they take a 17-0 lead over Yale. And in the stands right now is Sean McDonough. As we mentioned at the outset, it is homecoming week here at Penn. And I'm here with George Hill from the class of 1925. George was an Olympian of the 200 meters back in 1924, finished fourth. And I know you've been coming to these Penn football games for a long time, George. Yes, I have. Tell us about the Olympics. Where were the Olympics that year? Right outside of Paris, France, Bloom Stadium. And you finished fourth, eh? Fourth, 200 meters, yeah. Did you run track while you were here at Penn? Oh, yeah. I was Hendrick Leader's champion in the 120, 1924. I was track captain. George is here today also with his very lovely wife, Olga. They're really enjoying the ball game. Let's go back to the action. Why does George look younger than Sean? 17-0 <laughs> Penn lead. Murphy kicks it off. Luzzy takes it at the goal line. Luzzy taken down at the 25-yard line. Mike Luzzy was the Yale quarterback a year ago. Rick Inskeep in there to make the stop, the sophomore for the University of Pennsylvania. I wouldn't be surprised somewhere along the line if I could go to see it happen right now, Dick. Mike Stewart, number 18, who played wide receiver and really one of the best athletes on the Yale team, will be stepping in to play quarterback, and they say he really is a heck of a runner. I don't know much about him as a passer. He, is, he has a very strong arm. I saw him in a uh, preseason scrimmage game, and he can get the ball there quickly. Well, he needs something. He is a sophomore from Altavon Springs, Florida. He's 5'10", 175 pounds. He has made two pass attempts this season, and he has completed both. And there you see the statistics on the scoring drive, which culminated in that field goal. Penn's problem is they're scoring too quickly. <laughs> it's very hot on that field, as we will probably point out consistently throughout the afternoon. First down, Yale at their own 25. Stewart is going to run. He cut that ball nicely and shifted arms with it, got across the line to the 34. Kevin Bradley rode him down, the co-captain all-Ivy linebacker for Penn. You can see the quickness of number 95, Kevin Bradley, from the I formation. Stewart rolls to his left. He has no intention of throwing. He sees the opening, really fine blocking there by Coase and Klein. And here comes number 95, the choo-choo train himself, Kevin Bradley, chasing him down from the backside. Sear, while he was in there at quarterback, was two for five, passing 13 yards. Yale has a second down and one at their 34. McCauley hit behind the line of scrimmage and gets back to the line of scrimmage as Jeff Fortner, the outside linebacker and sophomore from Cleona, Pennsylvania, majoring in physical therapy, did a number that time. Yeah, really well, he got his hands on the right part of the body, which was the waist, and threw him down. McCauley is really their only home run threat. We saw him uh, three weeks ago, or two weeks ago, run 71 yards, the longest play from scrimmage in the Ivy League. But the problem is, how do you get outside on a team that probably has the strength to the outside? Yale with a third down and one at the 34. Stewart cuts it up for the first down and gets plenty more across the 45 to the 47. So another ingredient has now been introduced into the ball game, and that's the running of quarterback Stewart, Mike Stewart of Yale. 
got right by Pete Gallagher that time. Well, Stewart's doing the best thing he can do, which is run the ball, and he's getting pretty good inside blocking. Much better than doing that than putting it in the air and getting an interception. They have not been very successful. That's the first first down they made, isn't it? I believe so. First down at the 47, it is. That is Yale's first down of the afternoon. Depends nine, and the Eli's decide they want to call timeout as they trail in the second quarter here, 17 to nothing with 10.25 remaining. Conference going on on the sidelines. That's the brain trust at Eli's. Uh, Seb Lespino, offensive coordinator on the left side in that picture. Well, next week, what are our possibilities, Upton? There's Dartmouth, Columbia, Harvard, and Brown. That looks like a key. Yale's at Cornell, Princeton at Penn. Well, I'd like to be at, back to Princeton for the campus again. That should be a real good game, particularly if Princeton beats Harvard today. Or I'd like to stay in Boston so I don't have to go on the road anywhere and watch Brown. Brown beat Cornell last week. Harvard, Brown probably give them a pretty tough time defensively. That's why those Ivy scores this afternoon are pretty important. Taking a look at what happens between Harvard and Princeton this afternoon. Here you see what the score is in the second quarter. And Yale having just picked up their first down under their second quarterback of the ball game, Mike Stewart. Mike Sear started. Mike Curtin, number seven normally, is on the sidelines and shorts with a heavily bandaged five with the Charlie Horse problem that he had. Mike Luzzi in motion to the left. Ted McCauley, the sophomore. Out of bounds he goes after picking up a few. Driven out of bounds by Denton Walker, the inside linebacker. And some first quarter scores, huh? Dartmouth leading Cornell. 3 0. Holy Cross leads Brown. Holgate's ahead of Columbia. And Harvard, Princeton, nothing, nothing. They promised to take that down at the very end, that Harvard-Princeton game. That could be a stumbling block for Harvard. They've got the win, same as Penn does, to, to meet here in two weeks. Harvard and Penn are 3-0 in Ivy League play. As Murata goes in motion to the left on the second down and three, as Klein picks up the first down for Yale. That's the second first down of the ball game. Tim Chambers, the all-Ivy cornerback, comes up to make the hit. Chambers, the preseason All-American, as we mentioned, designated by the Sporting News super football player, outstanding young man. Majoring in economics here at the University of Pennsylvania. That's so he can represent himself when he's drafted high in the pro draft. Not a bad idea. And he gives a 10% to himself. First down, Yale at the 38 of Penn. Kevin Moriarty, rather quiet in the ball game so far. Stewart decides to run again. Finds some room, takes it to the 25-yard line. Or he is tripped up there. Dwayne Hewlett came over very quickly. Also, Joe Lorenz was in there to get a piece of it. Another first down for Yale. That's their third on this drive after having Penn have nine to their none. The upfront blocking has improved on this drive as well. Helps with a better runner back there, too. Tim O'Shea in the lineup, number six for Yale. He has not played much this season. Stewart, three carries for 35 yards for Yale from the quarterback position. Dave Klein finds the going very tough inside on the first down play. Steve Pisano, the defensive end, in there to make the stop. A junior out of Revere, Mass. That's near you. Somewhat. The... Uh the Yale offense is now going back to what they did in the beginning of the game. They're running at the Penn defense. Hotter it gets down there, and it's gotten awful hot. If there was no breeze here today, I dare say it would be 90 degrees on that field with that artificial turf. But they've got a quarterback that can run, so he's going to spread the defense a little better. It is second down and seven now for Yale at the Penn 22. Stewart wants to run, but this time finds the going very tough. He gets inside the 20 to the 19. Once again, Tom Gilmore, the defensive tackle, closes it down very quickly. The junior from Philadelphia. Now here's where Yale has had a problem all afternoon so far in the first half, and that is third down. I'm sure that they'd like to get Stewart outside with the run pass option. Probably have him keep it. Third down and four. Yeah, McCauley is the deep back in the eye. Stewart driven out of bounds at about the 15-yard line. 
by Denton Walker, the inside linebacker. And that is enough for a first down, so Yale keeps its drive alive. Glad he was listening to me. Let's see if I can send instructions down to the bench. That was Yale's first third down conversion in five attempts. They trail 17 to nothing if you just joined us with 8.03 remaining in the second quarter. O'Shea wide on the left, Luzzy wide on the right. McCauley takes it close to the 10 yard line. Tom Gilmore again, the first man to get there, number 79 for Penn to make the hit. Good cutback by McCauley there. He saw that it was not open outside. But back in the teeth of defense, only Gilmore stood between he and the goal line. McCauley really is a good runner. He really does pick the holes well. I think he might be their best threat. Second down and six as he picks up four. The ball's on the 11-yard line of Penn. This is naturally Yale's deepest penetration of the ball game to date. Marauders in a slot at the right. McCauley gets the call inside the 10 to the seven yard line. Gilmore, this is getting to be very repetitious. Tom Gilmore again in on the hit. That's because they keep running inside. And I would have to say it's pretty close to a first down, Dick. Maybe what, a yard two? Uh, maybe a good two, two and a half. Closer to three. They're keeping the ball on the ground and running the clock down even though they're down 17 nothing. Third down and a long two on the seven yard line of Pennsylvania. A wide and split on the right. And Stewart decides to run to the left. Inside the five, gets down close to the two-yard line. They'll say his knee touches the three. Denton Walker there to hit him. And that is the first down. So it is first and goal to go Yale from the three-yard line of Pennsylvania. What a quarterback change can do. We'll see on the replay that he kept the ball all along. He faked the option, but he was keeping the ball himself probably the best play he runs. He never looks to option the ball. You'd think the defense would kind of play him instead of the option man. First down and goal to go Yale from the three-yard line of Penn. McCauley hurdles and he is met and hit it and met in midair, I should say, by Jerry McFadden, a defensive end. He hung out of the football. Looked like somebody was catching a fly. He went in the air and McFadden set it up beautifully. Toss from Stewart to McCauley. Good blocking up front. Great shot of a soaring bird, but he was hit square by number 77, Jerry McFadden. It's a very dangerous play. Jerry. Second down and goal to go from the one of Penn. Dave Klein into the end zone. Touchdown, Yale. What a, quarterback will do. Board first. what a quarterback will do. Dave Klein, number 35, will take this on a simple handoff to the fullback. Good blocking on the left side of the line. Met in the hole by Kevin Bradley, but too late. Steve Ander, number 74, and Paul Weimer, number 71, really did a good job, but they're just playing power football. First time this afternoon that Yale's on the scoreboard. They had trailed 17-0 before the drive. It is now 17-6, and Bill Moore will be attempting the extra point. Moore is a senior out of Bellevue, Washington. Moore splits it right through, and so Yale now trails by 10 as Pennsylvania leads 17 to 7. We're going to pause just a moment in our coverage of this game between the Quakers and the Bulldogs with the score, Pennsylvania 17 and Yale 7. Ivy League football is brought to you by the Travelers, the same people who bring insurance and financial services to corporations, small business, and families. The Travelers, where fairness is good business. GTE, an advanced telecommunications company, and also manufacturer of 6,000 different kinds of Sylvania brand lamps. American brands whose product lines include tobacco, food, personal care and office products, distilled beverages, and security services. American Express. Cards, traveler's checks, and vacation stores. American Express. Don't leave home without us. This is the Eastern Educational Network. Bringing you the very best in television, this is Channel 12, 
your station in the Delaware Valley. Almost as important as the score. Almost as important as the score, Upton, for Yale, was the fact that they consumed over six minutes on that drive. Kept the ball out of Penn's hands. Question is, though, who does it help more, Penn or Yale? Penn's still ahead on the scoreboard, although Yale did not try to get it all back at once. They didn't try and throw deep. Kept it on the ground, did eat up the clock, but they found themselves a quarterback. Portman and Camisio are the deep backs for Penn, and Yale tries a squibber. They pitch back now to Ortman, and he breaks out of the pack almost and takes it to the 35. Yale appeared to me on the kickoff to want to kick it and keep the ball on the ground, particularly on this turf. As you can see, the up man didn't want to handle it, so he gave it to Steve Ortman, and Steve is looking for a hole, and there isn't a big hole there, although Penn has good field position. All right, first down, Penn. On the scrimmage, their own 34-yard line. Hennigan goes in motion, the pitch back to Comisio, and he's hit behind the line of scrimmage. And that's Tony Rush, who came there from his side to bring him down from behind. And that's how Yale moved it on their first drive of the afternoon that resulted in points. Yale's defense seems to have settled down a little bit, although we still haven't seen the game go back on top again. I think he can get it anytime he wants it back there. But the linebackers are doing a lot better job of playing that pitch man. Bob Dooley in there at safety now for Yale as the deep man, the center fielder, as McGinn wants to go. And hanging on him, Holding. Tony Rush for holding. <laughs> That's the most flagrant call of holding you'll see all season. If you're going to do it, you <laughs> might as well do it well. And he's hit it well. After making a big play beforehand, stopping the pitch guy, he came out and really did it all this time around. I admire a guy that makes interference of, of like that. He's on Pat Bueller, who, is he, who he was hanging on to. <laughs> 5.19 to play in the second quarter. Comizio, by the way, has carried the ball six times for Penn for 22 yards, and Ortman has six carries for 23 yards. That's what you call a bounce. Offensive holding, defensive pass interference, no play. I swear this guy must have been a former quarterback. The way he yells, marks out those penalties. Anthony Chambers. Second down and 10 on the 34-yard line. Four pin. 5-19 to play in the second quarter. Penn puts so much pressure on that defense when McGeehan rolls to the corner and has the option to run a throw, although he'd like to throw more often than run. Leaves those cornerbacks all by themselves. You have to keep your eye on number 85, Warren Bueller, who's wide out there on the right as though two went in motion. They hand up the middle. And that's Stan Koss, the fullback. Gets it across the 35 to the 36, and Carmen Alacqua is there to meet him. Tony Rush got a piece, too. Penn felt if there was one thing that they were not doing so far this year was running their fullbacks enough, and Jerry Burke said that he was going to try and do that more today. With this lead, it makes it a little bit easier for them to do. But again, when they get themselves into a hole, I just watch them to go up top again. Third down and seven, and Penn is three for three in third down conversions in the ball game so far. And Gilles stunts him on the line of defense. Bumble. Bumble, and who recovers the football? Yale's all excited, but what's the call? It is, Yale has recovered. Recover their second Penn fumble of the afternoon at the 34-yard line of Penn. Your buddy Zineski from Pittsburgh did it. Actually, it was a poor snap. McGeehan under center. He never quite gets control from Smallis, number 56. And here comes 59 in there, Zineski, to recover it. All right, let's see if Yale can now take advantage. They get their second golden opportunity to ball game. The first time they recovered a fumble at basically the same position on the field in the other direction. They were unable to do anything, and the flag is dropped. They're See what happens. Consumed. The minute we say that, what happens? Too much time. Too much time. Dead ball. Procedure. Offense. Well, illegal procedure against the Eli's. That'll make it first down and 15 when they break out of the huddle. Four minutes 
and 40 seconds to play in this first half. Pennsylvania with a 17-7 lead. Penn scoring on the very first offensive play of the ball game for them, a 72-yard pass from McGee into O'Toole. Yale with a first and 15 at the 10-39. Paul Spivak in the lineup at fullback, number 43. A senior out of New Haven, Connecticut. Gets a couple. I, I might mention that Paul Spivak's father, if, if, if an incident uh, three weeks ago, will still speed back here. The snap is a little bit slow. The lineman a little bit slow. The snap's quick and the lineman a little slow getting off the line of scrimmage. His feedback's father is a lawyer down on Wall Street and said it didn't think his son would get a chance to play. And here he is two weeks later playing the second quarter. Second down and 13. And Stewart wants to throw. Looking for O'Shea. Incomplete. Tim O'Shea, by the way, number six for Yale, has great hands, but a little bit on the slow side. Peter Gallagher covered on that play, number 59. Well, it looked like they were trying to hit Peter Gallagher instead of O'Shea. That's the first time he has dropped back straight and thrown, and Carmen probably isn't too happy, but his ball really took off on him there. It is now third down and 13, so a key third down and 13, and once again, Yale finds difficulty moving the ball after recovering a fumble. Blitz. Marwidi. And flags go down. We have an injured player as well. Keenan uh, Nix making a tackle. Marwidi on the other end of the reception, number 33. Clip on the play against Yale, so that nullifies whatever gain, and they, they keep going this way, and they're going to uh, be doing a good job. Yale's offense will be playing the defense. We have, do have a man down for Yale. Can't pick up the number from here. Marwidi, of course, number... Clipping on the offense, refused, fourth down. Marwidi was the one who made the touchdown catch after Columbia had tied the game up a week ago for Yale. Looks like his ankle, his right ankle. It is Marwidi, number 33, who did make the catch, who is down. He tried to thread his way across the field. Now he's holding his head. Sometimes you can't see that when you get hit from the blind side. It was really a tight end delay, almost a tight end screen. Pennsylvania was coming to try to take the pressure off. It does appear to be his right ankle. Andy Marwidi, 6'4", 220-pound senior tight end out of Lake Forest, Illinois, majoring in political science at Yale. <clears throat> that has to hurt Yale somewhat, although Marwidi had been splitting the time up with Mark Quinnivlin, who came back two weeks ago. But with those two big tight ends, it gave them a lot of offense, and, and especially when they wanted to use the two tight ends to block. And Carm Koza has always used his tight ends as alternates on just about every other play. Fourth down and 18 now. Eaton doing the punting for Yale. Chambers back there for Penn. Camps under it at the 12. It's by Keenan. And brought down in the vicinity of the 20-yard line. Who knows as we look back on that series of downs when Yale got their second big break in the game and didn't take any advantage of it whatsoever, what that'll mean in the end of the game. If they had had any kind of score, they could have gone in at halftime, maybe only seven, three points down in the game. This way, they're no better off. Pennsylvania with the first down at their own 20, and Ortman carrying the ball across the 25 to the 31. Bob Dooley, the safety, finally brings him down. Ortman was geared up with a head of steam. Steve Ortman is a good outside runner. Here he is the tailback in the eye position. Good blocking for the left-hand side. He just cuts in behind the tackle and the guard. Five or six yards on the play. That's all they want now. They can run this clock out now with 3.05 left in the game. Michael Tool, the fullback number five for Penn, the ball carrier, gets up close to the 35-yard line. Yves LeVissier, a sophomore out of Flushing, New York, the strongest player on the Yale team, number 73, made the stop, playing in only his second game of the season. Had a shoulder separation. The 
word from the sideline is that Marwidi may have a sprained ankle and probably is out for the rest of the ball game. His flag's still down, and the pass is complete to Steve Orkman. Harmon Alakwa covering on the play. You wonder why John McGeehan is so dangerous? He's going to roll to his right and step up inside. Sees his man open. Hits him right on the break. That's Steve Hortman. He does use his backs well. Left side. Quick. Catch white. Refuse. First down. McGeehan's also dangerous because his passing percentage is outstanding this afternoon. Nine attempts, seven completions, 153 yards, and two touchdowns. The defense still has to have in their mind that open series of plays. 11 seconds, 72-yard touchdown. First down, Penn at their own 43-yard line. They have 10 first downs to Yale's five. Yale showing the four-man front defensively. And O'Toole is, or rather O'Neill rather, is hit head-on at the line of scrimmage by John Quinn. Mike O'Neill, the junior out of Hickory Hills, Illinois, finance major at Penn. Pat Bueller and Sean Shoulder check into the Penn lineup. 83 and 82. Second down and 10 to 43. Eric Rutherford is also in at split end for Penn, wide on the left side. And Penn decides to try the middle, get it to the 45-yard line to pick up a couple. Mike O'Neill, they just want to run the clock down. And maybe they'll take one shot deep. John Zineski at the bottom of that pile. 17-7, Pennsylvania with a 10-point lead here at Franklin Field, homecoming weekend. Penn is three for four in third down conversions as they have a third down and eight now from their own 45. And again has a lot of time and finds his man, Jim O'Toole, who picks up the first down. Tony Rush in on the tackle. Good faking by the quarterback, McGeehan. Freezes the linebacker, sets up beautifully. Gives O'Toole time to come across underneath the defense. Nobody near him. Nice thing about O'Toole is the way he runs after the catch. Forget it all because there's a flag on the play against the University of Pennsylvania. One of the few times that, that Penn has killed himself with a penalty. Still third. Back to the 35-yard line. Yale catches a break on that. I'm going to make that uh, official my uh, gym instructor. He really barks out those signals. Third down and 18 now for Penn. Line of scrimmage, their own 35. 59 seconds left to play in the half. Pressure gets away from Zaneski. Looking for Hennigan. Incomplete. Threw it behind him. Al Hennigan, the co-captain, the deep threat. Guy they look to on so many first down occasions, but the ball thrown behind. Fourth down now for Penn, and coming out of the field is Sam Coroniti. First time this afternoon we see Mr. Coroniti, a senior punter from King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, averaging 37 yards a punt. McCauley back in single safety for Yale. He is Yale's leading returner on punts. His longest has been 52 yards this season. Taken by the short man for the Eli's and driven out of bounds. That's John Shannon, defensive back. John Shannon, a junior out of River Forest, Illinois. Well, it's yeah. a very good punt, and they're going to have good a field position with 46 seconds left. They might as well let it all hang out, see if they can get something up on the board. 27-yard punt for Sam Coronini, 10 yards under his average. Yeah, at the 45-yard line, and Mike Sear back in at quarterback Probably because means they're he throw has it. a stronger arm. Yep, means they're going to throw the football. Just going to go for broke on these three downs and punt. And he gets cut. And McCauley drops the ball. McCauley had nothing but six on his mind as he caught it. And Dwayne Hewlett covered the loose ball for Pennsylvania. So... I really, Macaulay, the sophomore, was thinking run before he caught it, and it popped loose. I really question whether McCauley had complete control of that football on the play. It was well set up with McCauley clearing underneath the coverage. 
Hewlett made the recovery, but I don't think McCauley had the ball. He was running before he had it, and therefore, I don't think he had control of the ball. I think I am going to agree with you on that, Upton. Well, thank you. We'll see it on the replay. 38 seconds left. Penn has the ball. First and 10 at the Yale 47. Again, a lot of time. Underneath, and Alakwa intercepts for Yale. He's not fast, but there's a flag on the play. Alakwa is driven out of bounds at the Penn 27-yard line. There's a flag back at the 47. We'll see who the penalty is on. The question, we have another flag running out of bounds. Probably somebody gave him a shot going out. But the question is, which team wants to give the other one the touchdown? On the replay, McLean delivers it beautifully, but to the wrong guy. Number 40, Carmen Alakwa. And he's heading for the sidelines, and he thinks he's going to head for six points. Out of bounds, he takes Holding the shot on the sideline. Against line. the offense, refused. Dead ball, foul, personal foul, first down. All right, so you're going to get more yardage marked off from the personal foul, side of the personal foul over there at the 25. You know who it was, too? It was number 14, John McGeehan, who gave him a shot going out of bounds. How do you like that for a feisty quarterback? So there's 27 seconds remaining on the clock in the first half. As the penalty uh, yardage is now going to be marked off. There you see the statistics. So that puts the ball on the 13-yard line of the University of Pennsylvania. 27 seconds, plenty of time. Dead ball, personal foul, half, half the distance. First down. This guy gets more excited as they get closer. It was McGeehan, too. We see uh, uh, McGeehan right now, and he's upset with himself. All right, Yale has a shot. Trailing 17-7 to get some points. Mike Sear at quarterback looking for Kevin Moriarty. Overthrows him. Timmy Chambers covering back there for Pennsylvania. That was the all-Ivy cornerback. That was a case of uh, Timmy Chambers being beaten this time. They had single coverage. And he just overthrew him, Dick. He, he had to drop, and that's a, not an easy pass to throw. But he had him perfectly placed. He just didn't throw the ball well enough. 23 seconds. The play consumed only four. So it is second down and 10 Yale. Line of scrimmage is the 12-yard line. Yale has had two big breaks in this game, unable to capitalize on any. This is their third. And Quinlevin can't get himself turned around. And the pass is incomplete. Gavin O'Connor covering on the play, but Quinlevin couldn't untrack himself to go in the opposite direction that he was going for, going for the sideline, the ball thrown behind him. 16 seconds left to play in the first half. Pennsylvania leading 17 to 7. They almost could have called an interference play, tripping on Penn on that play, but it wasn't, I guess, in their minds on purpose I'll but say one thing for a guy who, for a guy who winces when you shake hands with him Carmen Alacqua has played some first half of football with that shoulder bruise he, that was a 44 yard interception return it is third down and 10 now Yale at the 12 yard line 16 seconds to go in the first half going for the touchdown and broken up and looking for Kevin Moriarty coming over there to cover on the play was Ross Armstrong and Moriarty it had it he had it in his hands which means if you have it in your hands, you should catch it. He was hit after he caught it, but he should have caught this football. Sear is now scrambling to his left, sprinting to his left. He's looking for Moriarty in the left end zone. Moriarty has the ball, but whoops, he lets it go, but he should have had it. Bill Moore will be attempting his first field goal attempt of this season. He has had no opportunities until now. It will be a... 34-yard field goal attempt for Yale. And Bill Moore gets the field goal, so Yale doesn't come away empty on that interception. And the score is now Pennsylvania 17, Yale 10, with five seconds left to play in the first half. And Sean McDonough has some news. Dick, as you mentioned earlier, Andy Marwini left the game with a sprained ankle, and we believed it to be more serious originally than it was. Originally, our report from Daphne Bennett, the head trainer over on the Yale sideline, was that Marwini would not be able to return. But the latest report indicates that he might be able to return, and certainly that is very good news for the Yale Bulldogs. 
So there's only five seconds remaining in this first half, and Bill Moore probably goes for the onside kick, right? He did it before. Why not do it again? Yale, who was out of this football game in the second quarter, got themselves back into it. 17 to nothing, and it appeared that Penn could name their score, but Penn has been their own worst enemy in the last three minutes. And if Moriarty had held on to the football, they'd be just a little bit closer. Bill Moore doing the kicking, number three, and he squibs it. Comes into the hands of Ortman. He picks it up and controls. Bob Dooley gets down there quickly to put the first hit. Conant Fender's there for the second. That runs out the half. And at the end of the first half, Yale has put themselves back into the ball game as they trail only by seven. Well, I think that Jerry Burt is happy that he's gotten off the way he has right now because it could have been 17 to 14 instead of 17 to 10. I'm quite surprised because I think it could have been a runaway, as I said just a minute ago. Now it's anybody's ball game, although I think that Penn still has a superior defense. Well, again, it fires up. We have an injured Yale player down on the field. That's John Shannon, number 28, who's being assisted off the field here, looking limping on that uh, left ankle. But the other side of the factor is that when Yale comes out of the locker room to start the second half, they will be getting the ball. Uh, That's the worst thing that's happened to them. So, they haven't so let far. Penn have the ball. No, I'm sorry. I take that back. It was Penn who... Uh, Penn, Yale had won the opening toss of the game. I just forgot that they couldn't able to convert their first down and had to get rid of it. And they had a punt. Then Penn came back for that touchdown. Their first offensive play of the game, 72 yards from John McGee and Jim O'Toole. <laughs> that consumed an amazing 11 seconds. And Penn was out in front just like that. They come right back. Boom. Ortman goes in. And they're out in front 14 nothing before he could really settle down in this game. And But the Yale's come back and fought their, fought their way back. And uh, right now, here's a message from the president and from the athletic director of Yale University. On the occasion of Yale's 1,000th game of intercollegiate football, Athletics Director Frank Ryan joins Yale President A. Bartlett Giamatti to discuss the philosophy of Ivy Athletics and the role of athletics at Yale. In the beginning, of course, Yale had uh, much to do with the leadership of football in America. Well, Yale's tradition, as you said, is a very old and I think remarkable one. Uh, Walter Camp, Amos Alonzo Stagg, uh, these figures and lots of others helped to create, didn't do it alone, but helped to create the game of American football as we know it. One of the reasons why Yale has a glorious tradition in football and in other athletic uh, areas is that the institution has never undervalued it nor, nor overvalued it. How does that relate to the spirit of education at a place like Yale? It is clear that the stretching of the spirit and the discipline uh, of the body and the mind that athletics uh, uh, necessarily engages is very much a part of that same set of processes that also take place in the classroom and in the laboratory, but it also means that it is, if you will, kept in perspective and in proportion to the rest of the academic mission. The primary purpose, after all, of coming here is for an education which is academic. And here we are at halftime at Franklin Field in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where the Quakers have a 17 to 10 lead over the Bulldogs of Yale at halftime. And down on the field, the first Pennsylvania Championship Ivy League football team being introduced to the crowd. There's that person prepared for anything with that array of buttons. And there they are, the 1959 Ivy League champions. A lot of your friends in there, Upton. Well, they're all millionaires. I never made it to their point, but a lot of the, the young guys that I played with in prep school, Barney Berlinger was the captain of that great team, and he's down there. He doesn't look any different than he did before. He just has more money than all of us. And he runs just as much as you do, too, though. Well, we're halfway through the season, and my good friend Upton Bell takes a look now at the current Ivy League race. This year, the team to beat is Penn. Led by quarterback John McGeehan, the Quakers have outscored their opponents by more than 28 points a game. In the backfield, the Quakers start senior Steve Ortman, a slashing runner with good speed to the outside. 
But it's his backup, soft sensation Rich Camizio, that may well lead this team, not only in rushing, but to the third straight Ivy League title. The best offense is a good defense, and Coach Jerry Burt's team has the best in the league, led by All-American Timmy Chambers. A cornerback, Chambers also returns punts and kickoffs and is a threat to score any time he touches the ball. At Harvard, Brian White runs Joe Resick's high-flying multi-flex offense, and one of his favorite targets is Captain Steve Abbott. But the most exciting Crimson player, maybe the most exciting player in the entire Ivy League, is 14 on your program, Robert Santiago. The great wingback who leads the league in rushing, Santiago averages an incredible 7.3 yards every time he touches the ball. Brown, the Bruins have a tough time with Penn, but they have a fiery young leader in Steve Kettleberger, their quarterback. Brown's leading rusher, Kettleberger, can also throw the ball, and when he gets it to his big tight end, Greg Roth, it's usually for a big game. In the backfield, Brown also has fullback Steve Heffernan, a tough competitor who can get into the end zone. But the most dangerous player on the Brown team may be safety Karen Bigby. In the opening game of the season against Yale, Bigby stole this pass near the goal line, blew past four Yale defenders, and then incredibly recovered his own fumble and raced for 92 yards and a touchdown. It was only one of three interceptions by Bigby on the day. In Princeton, quarterback Doug Butler directs the high-scoring Tigers offense with his pinpoint passing. Butler's favorite target is Derek Graham, the two-time All-Ivy League receiver who always seems to come up with the big catch. In the backfield, Princeton is led by Dan Pellegrino, the gritty tailback who leads the team in rushing with 275 yards and three touchdowns on the year. After a slow start, Yale has come on winning its last three games. The first string quarterback is Mike Curtin, a pinpoint passer who looks to tight end Andy Marwiti when he needs a first down. Behind Curtin at quarterback is senior Mike Sear, here throwing to Mike Stewart, who in turn finds Mike Luzzi for the touchdown. In the backfield, the workhorses are number 35, Dave Klein, and number 31, Rick Coase. Both are tough and close. And while Klein and Coase are the starters, it's a substitute by the name of Ted McCauley who may lead Yale into contention for the Ivy title. Against Dartmouth two weeks ago, McCauley broke the game open with this 71-yard scamper for a TD. the Ivy League, but if we can, let's chit-chat back and forth for a couple of moments about some of the people we might have missed and some of those players on other teams who we weren't able to touch upon. First, let's start with the two teams out here this afternoon. For Penn, you have Kevin Bradley, who I think is an outstanding player. Also on defense, Carmen Alacqua, who came up with a big interception for Yale here in the first half. Where do you think those two players fit in as far as the hierarchy of defense in the Ivy League? Well, I'd have to say, first of all, that if Kevin Bradley weighed 230 pounds, he'd probably be a, a number one choice in the National Football League. He has much more speed than Alacqua, but I think Alacqua is as good a tackler. I think it's interesting that both these clubs really are somewhat staying in this game because of their defense. Right. Penn, to me, will win the Ivy League if they win it because of their defense, not because of their offense. If Yale is to survive today, and they might very well with the way they've done, the best thing that they could do is let Penn have the football because that's where they've made all their breaks is on defense. The offense has just not been able to take advantage of it when they've had to. Absolutely right. Let's talk about some of the great backs that we've seen. Actually, we didn't see one of them, Rich Weissman for Dartmouth, but I know up in, in your research, you've seen him on film. Last week, we saw Tony Baker at uh, up in the Cornell game. I'm wondering where you think those two backs fit in. You mentioned Robert Santiago might be the best back in the league, but let's rate these guys as we go down the list. Well, are you going to pay me if I do it? Yes. <laughs> well, actually, Rich Weissman, I, it, it's too bad that uh, our audience has not had a chance to see Weissman because 
He does not have great speed, but he runs and catches the ball probably as well as any one of the backs in the Ivy League. And I think if he had played against Yale, it might have been a, a different story. Baker's really a fine back, but they really didn't use him as much as we thought they would last week. But still, in the end, when you look at all the good backs in the league, the first guy you mentioned, Santiago, in my opinion, is far and above the best back in the Ivy League. Well, Upton, that is why they pay you the big bucks, and that's why you're our expert analyst. It's been a pleasure to talk to you at halftime. We'll talk to you a little bit more uh, during the second half. Now let you and Dick uh, bounce around next week's matchup. Well, that's what shapes up for next week, and Dartmouth's at Columbia. That'll have no factor in the Ivy League race. Harvard's at Brown. That has a very definite bearing on what takes place in this Ivy League title chase. Yale and Cornell. Again, uh, Cornell winless coming into today. Yale... Two and one Ivy League play coming into today. What happens here this afternoon it has a definite factor on their bearing for the rest of the season. And Princeton, of course, in the thick of the race. Like if Harvard. If, if uh, I were you know, voting right now. Yeah, if I were voting where to go, I would probably if Penn wins today, if they win, I'd probably want to go see Penn play Princeton because Princeton has Butler and Graham, really the guys that can run and throw and really make the real problem for Penn's defense. Anytime you get a good thrower, Penn's going to have a problem. Probably be the best game, maybe even Harvard and Brown. If Brown wins and Harvard beats Prince today, that might be the game to see. It would be because of the fact that Harvard would be undefeated as well in Ivy League play. And of course, what happens here, Penn pulls it out. They're still undefeated in Ivy League. Not only pulled out, they're out in front and they're fully expected to win this afternoon they are a two touchdown favorite coming into this ball game today against the Eli's especially with homecoming and all the festivity that's been around in the on the in campus area for the last couple of days and excitement and so forth and last night's pep rally and of course and then on any Ivy League campus you know it's not just the major sports that take place it is certainly not just football basketball and baseball all kinds of sports all kinds of sports take place on the intramural level and we're going to see, uh, there you saw freshman football and yesterday here on Franklin Field turf. Penn Cross beating them. Men's soccer, there was a tie. And cross country championship. Then uh, Dartmouth uh, taking that one out. That was held, as you see, in Van Cortland Park. Cross country championship. The women, Harvard won that. Field hockey. Penn women shut out Yale. That took place here. Who won in band competition? And now we have a special message from uh, the good people here at the University of Pennsylvania. Talent, desire, discipline. These are the tools. The goal is excellence. Whether in athletic or academic pursuits, the pursuit of excellence is the common thread which ties together the four undergraduate and the 12 graduate schools of the University of Pennsylvania. The university was founded in 1740 by Benjamin Franklin as a charity school. Today, Penn reflects a broad spectrum of diversity in its academic and research endeavors and the ethnic and cultural background of its community. We are live here at halftime with Pennsylvania out in front of Yale by a score of 17 to 10. It is a real pleasure for me, a privilege, to interview here at halftime one of the all-time greats, not just in Penn football history, but in the history of this game of football, Chuck Bednarik. Chuck, you played here at Penn, and in your professional football career as well, you were known as one of the last, probably the last guy who played on both sides of the football in that famous championship game in 1960 against the Packers, which you won as a member of the Philadelphia Eagles. You went 58 and a half minutes. You don't see that anymore. No, because starting way back in the high school, the kids aren't taught that any longer. Fortunately, I was able to do it. I was kind of forced into it. 
And I did it four times that year, including the championship game right here against Green Bay, which we won. That's the only game that Lombardi ever lost in the playoffs. And, and the thing that makes me so extra proud, I was 35 years <laughs> old at the time, you know, just about when you finish with your career. But in all four games that I did it, we won. And it's just something, uh, memories for me. And I played on this field so many times and so many memories. When the cadets came marching in, I played against Blanchard and Davis, the midshipmen, full houses every Saturday. Got a nice crowd today, too. Let's backtrack a little bit to your career here at Penn. You played in the mid-40s. You were an All-American twice. You played on some great teams. You guys were a powerhouse in the mid-40s. We were ranked always in the top 10 or top 15. Um, and then, of course, rank in the way of attendance. We were ranked one, two, or three with Ohio State. There were always sellouts here. And as I say, it, let me tell you something. The funny part about it is when I got discharged from the service in 1945, I was ready to go to college, and I went and saw my high school coach. I said, Coach, where should I go? And he was thinking, he said, how about the University of Pennsylvania? And I said, where is it? I didn't even know where it was. I only lived 50 miles north because back then we were in the boondocks. Of course, World War II came along. I was 17, and I went right in, came out. And it's the greatest thing ever happened to me. I played football for Penn for four years. I played for the Eagles for 14. So I played in this one town 18 consecutive years. And they love you here still. 1956, the Ivy League kind of de-emphasized football. And I know at the time you were kind of an outspoken critic of that, but now you feel pretty pleased with the emphasis placed on football in the uh, conference. No question. I was really brokenhearted because from the 78,000 people, it went to 6 and 7,000 people. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. I admire Ivy League football, and I admire Ivy League kids because these kids, 95% of them, will graduate. And if they're good enough, they want to play pro football, they can play pro football. Today, what you've got in most of these colleges are nothing but football factories. And most of those kids, if they don't make it in, in a professional football, they don't even graduate or get a degree. And it's a sin. It's win, win, win in these big colleges. And I love the Ivies. I think they're doing it the right way. Not only the Ivies, but independent schools like the Lehigh's, the Lafayette's, and your Bucknell's, and so forth. Chuck, I know uh, for many years you worked with Dick Vermeil over on the Eagles staff. What are you doing now? Well, I, did, I was with Dick Vermeil for seven years. I'm a corrugated box salesman here in Philadelphia for an outfit called Regal Corrugated Box Company. I'm a member of the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission for a number of years. That doesn't pay much, but the benefits are real good. But my big job is, of course, in sales. And, of course, up until two years ago when Vermeil was here for seven years, I was um, sort of an honorary coach, or more or less an image. I traveled with the team. I liked it and I hated it. I just got sick and tired of traveling. So right now on weekends, aside from coming to Lehigh games or Penn games, I'm on a golf course. All right, Chuck, you look great. You look like you go out and play 58 and a half minutes today, but it's kind of warm. Would it be too warm today to go out and do that? Yes, no question it would be too warm. And listen, I'd like to say that tomorrow afternoon between the Eagles Cardinals at halftime, Alex Wojohowicz, Pete Piho, Steve Van Buren, the late Norm Van Brocklin's wife, Commissioner Bert Bell and myself were being honored. Our names will be put up on a facade at Veterans Stadium during the football season. So it's a nice weekend. Well, I know that you're very honored by that. Thanks very much for taking the time out to talk to us. Always good to see you, Chuck. Thank you, Sean. That's Chuck Bidnerick, one of the all-time greats in the history of football anywhere. Let's go back to Dick and Upton. That really, really was an enjoyable interview. Well, huh? you, know, it's, it's you know Chuck very well. It's funny that uh, I'm going to be there tomorrow with Chuck Bednarik when my father and Chuck Bednarik and Norm Van Brocklin and Van Buren and Wojciechowicz will be put up on the wall. And uh, I thought he was the greatest two-way player that ever played football. The greatest. Not too many people are going to argue with you about that. Not at all. Well, of course, yesterday, Upton Bell had a chance to chat with George Kovo. He was the quarterback of the 1959 Penn Ivy Championship team and an executive now on the university staff. George Kovo, quarterback of the 1959 Penn team. I hope we can get through this interview without too much noise. All this construction, but hey, you understand that. You played before big crowds then. You're right, although I must admit, up in the, the weather today is so gorgeous. And when we played, I think every Saturday we had heavy downpours. So, uh, so you're right, this, this does bring back some fond memories. All right, I've got to ask you, uh, everybody likes to look back and think they had the greatest team of all time, but it was the last great championship team at Penn until this present team tied for two Ivy Leagues in a row. What about that team? Compare the players then, or at least the talent then, including yourself, uh, to the competition of talent today. 
Huffton, I think the one thing I never try to do is compare today's athletes with the uh, the past. I think today's young men are so much better physically and they have more ability than we ever had. But I think relatively speaking, the team we had back then in the Ivy League probably could compete outside the Ivy League better than the Ivy League teams of today. But that just means the teams on the outside the league are, are getting that much better. But but I think the, the kids today are, are so much better than we ever were, and I see the size of them, and there'd be no way I know some of us would even play today. What do you think was spring practice, uh, what would happen uh, today if, if, if this present team, which has great athletes, what would they do with spring practice? Do they compete with anybody outside of the league? I don't think so. I think there's a certain caliber that they'd be able to compete with. I think the financial aid policies that the Ivy League has really restricts who they can go after and the types of uh, students they can attract, but I don't think spring practice would have that much of an effect except to improve the caliber within the league and and a certain level team that maybe the Delawares and the uh, the Lehigh's and the Lafayette's. All right, there's somebody that's interesting. Uh, you know, a lot of your friends off that team would often want to become millionaires. I still know <laughs> someone want to borrow some money from them, but you decided you, you wanted part of campus life. And since 1962, you've been part of the university, first of all, in the provost's office as the head provo. If you weren't, we're going to give you that title anyway. <laughs> And now in student services having to do with finances. Why, George Koval? Well, Penn treated me well. I enjoy the campus. Uh, it, it's something coming from the coal regions being associated with a school such as Penn. I always had the mystique with it. And I, I think I never, it never left me. So I, I stayed with it and uh, I've enjoyed it ever since. Well, you look like it. You don't have too many gray hairs. Oh, don't say that. They're, they're all gray. It's just that when you get a haircut, you can't see them as much. Good luck and thank you. Thank you very much, Captain. Super. We're with Charles Harris, the athletic director here at Penn. Charles, homecoming weekend, lots of festivities. I know you're just on to the 59 team. Well, it's, it's a great, great holiday for us, and of course, with this kind of crowd and this kind of uh, spectacle, I guess, it's, it's a real plus for us. We're excited about it. We're excited about what's happening in Pennsylvania, and glad you guys can be a part of it. Tell us what the 59 team did. Well, the 59 team still holds the distinction of being the first Penn team to win an Ivy League championship. Uh, that was 25 years ago, of course, and they're the only team really since then to win it outright. So uh, they're special for us in our history. Charles, I want to switch gears for just a second. You've been here now six years at Penn. When you came in, you were the youngest uh, athletic director in the history of the Ivy League. Did you feel any pressure personally on yourself to prove yourself either to your colleagues among the Ivy League ADs or within this university? I think probably I, you can't help but put pressure on yourself anytime you move into a job, but that's part of the judgment in, in accepting a position. Uh, I felt as though it would be a challenge. Uh, I felt as though there were some possibilities and and I clearly saw it as an opportunity, uh, both personally and professionally. Uh, probably, uh, I don't feel like I'm much the worse for wear. I think I've gained a lot more gray hairs a lot quicker than I would have under some other conditions. But it's been exciting for me. Well, certainly the record speaks for itself. Recount for us very quickly, if you will, that some of the championships that you've won. I know you won a number of them the last couple of years. Well, I think we were 21 or 24 in the last uh, three years. We won eight last year, which is... Uh, which is the largest number we've ever won in one year. Starting last fall with men, our men's and women's cross country teams, uh, through the winter, our men's and women's track teams. Uh, of course, the football team shared in the championship, and I believe volleyball in the spring men's and women's lacrosse. Charles, we gotta go. The second half has begun. Thanks very much. Okay, Charles. So the opening kickoff for the second half, and play will begin at the 20-yard line for the University of Pennsylvania. Penn out in front, 17 to 10. Let's find out if the Yale defense can make their defense into their offense. First play at his second half. Horton gets the call across the 25. He's hit by Bob Dooley, the safety, but he picks up good yardage on the play. So it'll be second down and about long five and a half for the first down. Temperature very warm here this afternoon almost unbelievable for this time of the year certainly near 80 in the 80s down on the field second down and five line of scrimmage the 25 Orton again he's very close to that first down Hardell McKenna the inside linebacker number 56 for Yale meets him almost head on uh, from up here maybe about a half yard short of that first down seems to be their favorite play and I guess they want to come out and see if they can loosen up that Yale defense a little bit there at the beginning of the second half as you mentioned the heat is going to be more of a factor now well, I would think that Yale would come out with a, with a, a lot of enthusiasm the way they finish, finish that first half well they can't let Penn get too many first downs or another quick score 
off the old yeah. That's about the fourth time they've done that. Zaneski's head went across that line. Well, they're going to pick up the first down on the penalty is the University of Pennsylvania. Dead ball, illegal procedure on the defense. Well, one guy that hasn't been tired out by the heat, and that's the official. <laughs> Anthony Chambers, our referee today, doing an outstanding job with his crew. There you see the halftime stats. And 225 total yards to 101 for Yale. Penn with the 225, of course, and the 17-10 lead. Time of possession almost equal. It's what's up on the scoreboard that counts. First down at the 35. Not too much yardage there as John Zaneski made up for going offside, stuck his head in there real quick. And actually about a half yard loss on the play. Wouldn't be a bad idea for Penn to control that football a little bit at the beginning of the second half, try to establish their team on the ground, eat up a little bit of the clock, and all the while make that defense play in this heat. Second down and nine at the 36. That's Mike O'Neill, the fullback, picks up a couple. Ardell McKenna there to bring him down. O'Neill, a junior out of Hickory Hills, Illinois. Not too big, 5'10", 190 pounds. That Yale defense really does feed everything into McKenna and Alakwa. But I'll tell you, they're very close to the line of scrimmage, and a little bit of play action might get them burnt again. Third down play for Penn, and it's third down and seven. Penn is three for six in first and third down plays this afternoon. Split on that left side. Again, over the middle looking for O'Toole, incomplete. Tony Rush going downfield with him. And so Penn will be forced into a punting situation now as Sam Coroniti will be coming on the field, number 10. This is one of the few times that the quarterback has been pressured today. He was trying to hit O'Toole. He was waiting for him to open up to see the ball took off, but that's because a defender was right in his face. Coroniti has one punt this afternoon for 27 yards. McCauley back there in single safety at around the 30. The line of scrimmage is the 38 for Penn. a 52-yard punt. McCauley with the return as a flag on the play. Gallagher made the tackle for Penn. He's got a flag down, too, I believe. Flag dropped immediately. Flag up around the 18-yard line. <laughs> 52-yard punt by Sam Coroniti. Usually when they're waiting that long, it's clipping. Clipping during the run back. Well, Yale, which, who did not get a good return, will have the penalty yardage assessed against them to put them even deeper in their own territory. <coughs> Mike Stewart at quarterback for the Elias. Number 18, the sophomore from Altamont Springs, Florida, who ignited Yale when he came into the ball game on their first drive for a score. Did it mostly with his running. And Penn yeah. probably knows that's what he's going to do again. Line of scrimmage for Yale is their own six-yard line. They try the middle. Get across that line of scrimmage and maybe pick up a yard. Tom Gilmore, the defensive tackle, closes in very quickly for Penn number 79. This is where Coroniti's punt with the tack on the 15 yards for clipping really helps Penn's defense. You know that they're probably not going to throw the football. If they throw anything, it's not going to be deep which means if you hold them, you're going to get the football back in good field position with the wind in your favor. Tim O'Shea checks into the lineup, number six for Yale. Second down and nine. Stewart, very close to the first down, driven out of bounds by number 95. Kevin Bradley, the co-captain, all Ivy linebacker. But Stewart was very close to that first down marker when he went out of bounds. If it wasn't for Bradley, he would, might have tacked another 10 yards onto that. He did get around the corner, but this is the third time that Bradley has come from the other side of the field to chase the quarterback down. Now he does pick up the first down. So he gets a little bit of breathing room. And the goal line is not immediately at their back. The line of scrimmage at the 19-yard line. The 
Coase finds the going very tough as he tries to go off his left guard, Steve Anderer. Denton Walker is there to get him and not allow him to go another foot. That Penn defense, those linebackers step right into the holes, and it's so difficult to run at them. They did a little bit in the beginning of the game, but they step in and fill the holes so quickly that all of their linebackers are quick. They're not really that big. Dale's captain is the setter, number 51, Marty Martinson out of Durango, Colorado. He does a good job consistently. Second down and seven from the 22. Over the middle, and Klein drops it. And there's a flag. Flag at the line of scrimmage. Actually, they wanted to delay the Klein on that, and they'll probably get caught for holding on what would be really a screen pass. How do you get holding for screening? But you do. There it is. There's the indication. Carm Toza concerned on the sideline. Stewart, the Yale quarterback, has carried the ball seven times in the ballgame. He's picked up 58 yards rushing. He's one for three passing for minus six yards. Jerry Burnt and his staff. Might be the second week in a row we saw Kettleberger, the quarterback for Brown, be the leading rusher last week as the quarterback. Might be the second week in a row that the quarterback for Yale in this case, Stewart is the leading rusher for them. Gismar, Coons, and Nix. Offensive holding, declined, third down. Check into that Pennsylvania lineup. Third and seven now for Yale at their own 22. Then 54 remaining in this third period, 17 to 10, Penn out in front of Yale. And, of course, undefeated in Ivy League play. Klein, the lone back for Yale. Third and seven. Stewart wants to run. And Stewart has picked up the first down and hangs on to the ball at the 34-yard line. Brought down by Steve Pisano, number 93, the defensive end. Here's McCauley, who was open for just a split second, but the quarterback, Stewart, decided to run with the football. There was pressure put on from the outside, and he took the least route of resistance up the middle. All right, so Yale picks up the second first down on this drive, and they're at the 34-yard line. This all began at the six. Rick Coe's met in that backfield head-on by Peter Gallagher, the outside linebacker, read it all the way. And the accounting major and the senior from Avon, Connecticut, just nailed him in his tracks. Here goes Yale from the I formation, but they never quite get into the play because Gallagher, 59, gets there before they get into it. Their linebackers, Gallagher, 59, Bradley, 95, Walker, 52, and O'Connor, 20. Again, I hate to keep repeating it. They're so quick, you never get the play off. Lose two on the play, so it's second down and 12, back to the 32. McCauley open at the 35 and brought down at the 37-yard line by Keenan Nix, the senior defensive back out of Albany, New York. Playing his first ball game today, he's been sitting it out with an injury. Best thing that Yale can do is get the ball in the hands of uh, McCauley, number 26, as much as they can. Third down and five as Rick Coase, number 31, checks in a tailback for Yale. Well, the backfield has Coase and Klein. O'Shea is wide on the right. Murata, Vince Murata wide on the left side. Third down and five. Stewart gets away. And here comes the pursuit again. Fires looking for O'Shea. It's caught at midfield. He's in Penn territory. Goes out of bounds in front of the Penn bench at the 42-yard line and Stewart's presence of mind kept the play alive. That's what you call scrambling. But that isn't this play. We've got another play where the quarterback scrambles. But he did it out of the picture. Stewart has eight carries for 71 yards. Well, let's just say he got it to O'Toole. Scrambled out of the picture and got away from number 79, Tom Gilnor, twice in the procedure, in the process. There's Stewart again with his running. This is deja vu last week on a different people, huh? 
uh, as you pointed out, the quarterback doing the running, and Stewart again picks up another first down before Dexter Desir, number 65, brings him down. Except Stewart, again, this is designed for him to run. He is not going to throw on this plane. He has Klein and Coe's out in front of him. Good blocking, breaks a tackle here. He's not only their best running threat, but remember that he is much bigger than Mike Sear by about two inches. Line of scrimmage at the 31-yard line of Penn. Yale has the first down. They trail 17 to 10, 8 11 to play in the third quarter. Rick Coe goes to the 25, to the 24. Kevin Bradley leading the gang tackling. Inside linebacker and co-captain for Penn. This time Coe did some fancy sidestepping to get himself in a position to go for the first down. He also got good blocking up front by 51 Marty Martinson, the team captain. Second down and three now as he picked up seven on that carry. Line of scrimmage, the 24 of Penn. I remember in this ball game, the Gale was 17 to nothing down before they scored any points. It is 17-10. Luzzi goes out wide on the left. Moriarty wide on the right. Goes fights to the 20. They've gone back to little power football. And that is enough for another first down for Yale. Joe Lorenz, the nose tackle, made the stop, but not until Coase had picked up the first down. And we might also point out, as we see Jerry Burke getting that worried look on his face, at number 33, who was injured in the first half, and Sean McDonough had pointed out wasn't as severely injured as we thought. Andy Marwiti is back in the game for Yale at tight end. Number 75, Jerry Waslowski, the right guard for Yale, has been doing some pretty good blocking on the last series. First and 10 at the 20 of Penn. McCauley. McCauley to the 15, picks up five. Kevin Bradley, right there to ride him down. But McCauley picks up five. It's funny, they are getting some running room inside on Penn. If they've moved the football at all today, they've moved it by the quarterback spurring out and keeping the ball. And you know he's not going to throw it. And also inside those the guards in the center. This time on the left side, they went behind Andrew and Weimer. Second down and five at the 15 of Penn. Klein picks up a tough three to about the 13. Gallagher, Peter Gallagher, the outside linebacker again on the stop. Very unusual for this Penn team to give up yardage like this. Third down and two when Yale will come out of the huddle as Quinlivan checks in and Moriarty checks out at tight end. Quinlivan is a senior and a 6-6 target. Yale is 5 for 11 on third down conversions this afternoon. Penn is 3 for 7. Third down and two. Stewart rolls out to the right. He wants the cut, but this time Penn says no. McFadden led that charge, and everybody else quickly gathered around. Well, Denton Walker was there, too. One time too many. Fourth Denton. down coming up. One time too many. The quarterback, Stewart, kept the ball, running down the line of scrimmage, looking for the opening, and there is no opening because 52 Denton Walker is there, and they are going to go for it. Going for it. No field goal attempt by Bill Moore, which is certainly well within his range. Yale trails 17 to 7. We have a, a 17 to 10. We have a fourth and one. And Stewart picks up the first down, I believe. It's very close, but I believe he's picked it up. We'll wait and see until the official marks it. I think you believe right. I think he made it. Joe Lorenz made the hit. Stewart actually turned his back to the line. Reverse pivot. To his right side, which is kind of dangerous. You, you know, with a yard to go, you think the quarterback might want to keep it or hand off to the tailback. He didn't this time. He looked down the line of scrimmage for his opening and found it. So it's first and goal to go now for Yale. Stewart, 85 yards rushing on 11 carries. Line of scrimmage is the eight-yard line. McCauley. Finds too much traffic to run behind, and Joe Lorenz brings him down. McCauley coming into the ball game for Yale averages was averaging eight yards a carry. He has four touchdowns rushing. Well, not only that, he also leads Yale in five different categories, including kickoff and punt returns. Second down, goal to go from the seven. Murata is out wide on the left. That's split in. Going to keep it. 
And he steps out of bounds at about the line of scrimmage. There was not too much gain there. As playing it wisely was Joe Lorenz. Also, Timmy Chambers came up to quickly to cover the corner, and there was well, no turning it. He didn't fool Tim Chambers. He was really faking, and it looked like he might keep it a little play action. Stewart from ground level, faking to McCauley, and he's got the ball tucked away, and he's fooled everybody but number 22. Timmy Chambers, who came in and made the play. If Chambers misses him, he's in for six points. Third down goal to go from the eight, and you have Luzzi in a slot at the left, Quinlevin wide at the left, and McCauley also wide at the left. You have a triple set, and we also have what? We've got too long a set, which means too much time. <laughs> I don't see a flag. Time yeah, out. it's called timeout. So evidently... Stewart saw something that he didn't like or couldn't read and uh, called timeout at the, almost at the snap of the ball. Well, a couple of upsets perhaps in the making. First, at Madison, Wisconsin, the Badgers are out in front of Ohio State, 13 to seven. That ball game is in the fourth quarter. Boston College has its hands full with Rutgers. That's 28-20 in favor of BC in the third quarter. Georgia having no problem with Kentucky. It's 30 to nothing. Bulldogs, that is in quarter number four. It is Pitt 28, Navy 14 there in the third quarter. Maryland all over Duke this afternoon. 43 to 7 is that score. Fourth quarter. TCU ahead of Baylor by 1 point, 21 to 20 there in the third quarter. Oklahoma State leads Colorado 17 to 8. That is in period number three. Michigan by three over Illinois in the third quarter. The score there is 13 to 10. North Carolina State leads Clemson 24 to 21. That is in the third quarter. Other game, second quarter, South Carolina 21, East Carolina 10. Also in the second quarter, Georgia Tech 13, Tennessee 10. Same score at Syracuse, where the Orangemen are on the short end of a 13 to 10 score in the second period against Army. First period, it's Vanderbilt 7 and Mississippi 7. Cincinnati is shutting out Louisville 13 to nothing, and Mississippi State leads Auburn in the first quarter 7 to nothing. That's the complete scoreboard as we have it right now. We'll update those later on. Bringing you the best in television, this is Channel 12 serving Greater Philadelphia and the entire Delaware Valley. And up for Yale at a tight end position. And Stewart is going to get nailed, this time way behind the line of scrimmage, back to the 14-yard line. Tom Gilmore, the defensive tackle, led the charge for Pennsylvania. That was a big play, very big hand. play. They sent their outside linebacker, number 59, Pete Gallagher, also Gilmore, was in on the tackle, but they sent Gallagher from the outside. Nobody picked him up. He had a clear shot at Stewart, so calling timeout meant nothing. Stewart, a little play action here. He's trying to set up, but number 59 from the outside, Pete Gallagher, was ready for him, forced him back into the pocket, and then 79, Gilmore took care of it. Now we're going to have Bill Moore with a field goal attempt of 30 yards, 31 yards. It's up. It's got the distance. It is good, and the score is Pennsylvania 17 and Yale 13 here in the third quarter. And we're going to pause just a moment in our coverage of this game between the Quakers and the Bulldogs with the score, Pennsylvania 17 and Yale 13. Ivy League football is brought to you by the Travelers, the same people who have provided value in insurance and financial services for over a century. The Travelers, where fairness is good business. GTE, the company that can provide complete telecommunications networks for voice as well as data. American Brands, whose operations include Master Locks, Sunshine Biscuits, Pinkerton's Protective Services, and Titleist Golf Products. American Express, cards, traveler's checks, and vacation stores. American Express. Don't leave home without us. This is the Eastern Educational Network. Three twenty-four left to play in the third quarter. It is now a 17-13 ball game with Yale and uh, with Pennsylvania in front by four. And Bill Moore, after the 31-yard field goal, kicking off for Yale again. A sidewinder comes up to Comizio at the 10. And Comizio takes it to the 27-yard line, up close to the 28 before he's driven out of bounds. Holy Cross leading Brown at the half in a non-league game today. 
Colgate out in front of Columbia rather easily at the half. Dartmouth and Cornell tied, and both of them looking for win number one. Harvard and Princeton, key Ivy League clash. Harvard undefeated in Ivy League play, tied at the half. And here it is, Pennsylvania 17, Yale 13, Penn with the ball first down their own 30. Up to the 31, picks up a yard. You know, Penn has slowly but surely let Yale creep back into this game. And their defense, while stopping them from two touchdowns, has given them field goals, and they're now within four points of this club. But the offense really has not generated very much after that initial strike there. No, it hasn't. It's a second down and ten. Line of scrimmage is the 30. And there's Stan Costa, fullback with good yardage. Very close, but about a yard short of the first down. Picks up that almost eight yards. Tony Resch, the monster back for Yale, brought him down. Costa, fullback, a senior out of North Dighton, Massachusetts. Number 69, John Zaneski, who many people feel is probably the best nose guard in the Ivy League. You watch his pursuit here on all fours he's crawling. He just misses Stan Koss, who goes off on a seven-yard game, but Zaneski is usually in on every play. Third down and two pen, their own 38. And the first down is picked up by Steve Ortman, who just with good second effort pushes out close to the 44-yard line. Bob Dooley had to come up from the safety spot to make the tackle. The first down is made for Penn. Well, evidently they feel that they can run on the ground on this club and, and eat up the clock. I still feel that any time that they want to go upstairs, unless Yale has made a great adjustment, Dick, they can do it. I kind of get the feeling that Penn is maybe lulling them there and with that ground attack and then just goes upstairs for the big one. Well, they better do it quickly. First and ten at the 45. Again, got the time. Look at the time. And wide open is Lau Hennigan. And what a catch at the 32-yard line. Co-captain Lau Hennigan. A super catch. That's what happens when you have the time to throw. Your tight end is wide open. McGee and off play action out of the eye. Fakes to Camizio. He's got plenty of time. Good blocking. He's looking to his right first, but then he sees Hennigan really deep behind the defense. Watch the way he keeps the foot in bound. Only one foot in bounds in college. And on the move at the 31-yard line of Yale. Over the middle, incomplete. I don't know if he was looking for Koss, the fullback, or Bueller. Or Tony or Hennigan, Rashiel. rather, Lyle Hennigan. How about Tony Reschiel? He was looking for him, yeah, too. Almost. Hennigan with a 24-yard reception on that big first down play. Interesting statistic. David Silk, our man with the stats, always on top of everything at these telecasts. Penn has not scored since Tom Murphy gave the Quakers a 17-0 lead three minutes into the second quarter. Thank you, David. Second down and 10 at the 31. And Koss gets nailed behind the line of scrimmage. Coming in there quickly for the Eli's is Eves Lapissier, the sophomore out of Flushing, New York, a pre-med student at Yale. Boy, do I love that name. Carmen Alakwa. You see the linebackers first. here, number 56, Alakwa, or Ardell McKenna and Alakwa. Both coming up, they're playing very close to that line of scrimmage. Important play to overuse a well-worn phrase. Third down and 10 here at the 31 of Yale. 10 with the ball. Yale's coming. And there's Mr. O'Toole. Jim O'Toole, number 34 for 10. Always has been the man on the spot this afternoon when Penn has needed that real good, big, and key yard. Anytime you get a wide receiver isolated on a linebacker, number 49, Tony Rash, out of the eye. McGeehan's got time to throw. He's waiting for him to clear. He sees him on the linebacker, right in front of the linebacker. You've got a mismatch in there. Completion, first down. McGeehan will just pick you apart if you give him the time, and he's had the time. On a reverse. That's Camisio, and there's six more for Penn. Take a look at this from two angles. First of all, the fake, and then the misdirection play to 42. Camisio, he breaks a tackle. Steve Fender's number 46 into the end zone. But really, the misdirection will watch the extra point, and then we'll come back and take another look at it. Tom Murphy with the extra point attempt. 
Murphy, who is 20 for 20 on the season, and makes it 21 for 21, and there's a flag on the play. Running into the kicker! We'll watch the score what, again and watch the way Mr. Camizio turns it on, breaks Steve Pender's tackle and into the end zone, but the misdirection was set up by the play before it. Rolling to his right, McGeehan completed the pass. This time they came back to their left. Rich Cabizio, with only 36 seconds remaining in the third quarter, has given Penn their first score since three minutes into the second quarter when they had a 17-0 lead. Pennsylvania now leads Yale 24-13. And more importantly for them as the crowd goes crazy is that they've regained the momentum. Macaulay and Luzzi are the deep men for Yale. The there's the Yale Bulldog. Nobody has to You're tell you, but handsome dandy. I'm sh I've Another lost the number. The I don't know what number it is. Makes it difficult when you have a quarterback that is an excellent runner, Mike Stewart, but is not much of a thrower. And they're now back down to nine points down. And Yale has not had good kick returns this afternoon. Penn's downfield coverage has been excellent. Buzzy and McCauley are the deep men for Penn. I mean, for Yale, sorry. Out of bounds. We'll do it all over again. Buzzy, number 10, one of the deep men for Yale, is out of East Haven, Connecticut. He was the former quarterback at Yale. He's an outstanding baseball player for the Elis as well. Does a little bit of everything. He's an outstanding field leader. Nice to see the large crowd here at Franklin Field. Franklin Field, which is being renovated to the tune of some seven plus million dollars. Upton Bell, they're doing a nice job with it. Well, we are, and they've constructed a new booth for us here. In fact, Jim Tuppany, who runs all the track events and, and, and events here at Franklin Field, was the man that did it, and he couldn't be with us today because he's going to his daughter's wedding. I guess that's a good enough excuse. It Jenny. certainly is. That's the best. If he's watching, we'd like to say along to Jim Tuppany. Congratulations to his daughter. McCauley is going to take it at the five for Yale. And McCauley gets across the 25 and about the 27-yard line is where he goes down. T.J. Marta is the one who makes the tackle on the kick return. Penn's drive. There you see the time consumed, 2 minutes and 48 seconds. Mizio capping it with the excellent run. Stewart at quarterback. He did not start. Michael Sear did. Stewart took over and has directed Yale. Clear. Kevin Moriarty wide open at the 45-yard line of Penn. They say he caught it out of bounds. No catch. Well, I question that Boy, one. Dwayne Hewlett was covering for Penn. They were down there, but I thought he caught it in bounds, or maybe that they called it that he didn't have possession because he's wide open. Stewart is rolling to his right with his tailback and his fullback in front of him. He gives Moriarty time to clear, and he is really clear down the sidelines. Oh. Now, you tell oh, me. They're saying no possession. That's what it'd have to be because his feet certainly were in bounds. Second down and 10, yeah, at their own 29. Score is 24-13, Pennsylvania leading Yale. 22 seconds remaining in the third quarter. Stewart's running, and nobody's blocking in front of him. Well, the going gets tough after the 35-yard line, and he goes down at the 38. Peter Gallagher comes up from the outside linebacker position along with Dwayne Hewlett to stop him. He really gets outside quickly. He's got his tail back and his full back in front of him, close and kind. Cuts in behind them, gets himself around the corner, and then Gallagher makes the tackle. And that's the end of the third quarter with the score, Pennsylvania 24, Yale 13. And now for an update from the sideline, Sean McDonough. Well, we're over here on the Yale, we're over here on the Yale drenched, uh, sun drenched Yale sidelines. In the intersequal time, we showed you the Penn cheerleaders earlier, so now we want to introduce you to the Yale cheerleaders. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Judy Hazlip. I'm a senior and I'm from New Haven, Connecticut. 
Hi, I'm Hugh Smith. I'm a junior and I'm from Trent, New Jersey. Hi, my name is Connie Chad from South Carolina and I'm a senior at Yale. David Benson, senior at Yale, Fort Raleigh, Kansas. Hi, I'm Tracy Martinez. I'm from Corpus Christi, Texas. I'm a senior. James Hogan, sophomore from Brussels, Belgium. Heather Cameron, I'm from Carlisle, Massachusetts, and I'm a freshman. Andy Benjamin, a sophomore from Clearwater, Florida. Michelle Demuth is a junior, and I'm from New Haven. My name's Mark Schulman. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, home of Yale. <laughs> Rob Clare, sophomore from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Pam Johnson. I'm from West Haven, Connecticut. I'm Jan. I'm a senior from California. I'm Steve Yates. I'm a sophomore, and I'm from Indiana. We'll meet the next couple after this play, but let's pick up the action. We'll come back. Paul Spivak just picked up the first down for Yale on the third down and one, brought it up to the 40-yard line. Gilmore made the tackle, Tom Gilmore, and first down's now in the ball game. Penn has 16 to Yale's 12. And we have a Yale player down on the field. That's John Krastowski, the sophomore out of Ansonia, Connecticut, left guard. And Sean McDonough once again. Let's uh, meet the rest of the Yale cheerleaders while we have some time. Your name? Hi, I'm Adrian Davis. I'm a sophomore from Detroit, Michigan. Hi, I'm Troyna Mitchell. I'm a junior. I'm from Roxborough, North Carolina. Hi, I'm Tracy Heiser. I'm a senior from Dallas, Texas. And this is Michael Danziger, otherwise known as Zig. He can't speak because he's got the mask on, but we'll speak for him. As you can tell, over here on the Yale sideline, the cheerleaders come from all over as well. Now back to Dick and Uppy. Yeah, now there you see Krastowski <laughs> going off the field, being assisted off by his teammates, gingerly favoring the leg. One of them, the left or the right, can't tell, but with a leg injury. First down, Yale at the 40 yard line, their own. We're in the final period of play. Rick Coase carrying the ball. Kevin Bradley on the tackle. He has been all over the field this afternoon. Kevin Bradley, preseason All America in the sporting news at the linebacker position, co captain of his Penn team. He hasn't done anything to discourage the, the All American tag. He only weighs 195 pounds for a linebacker. <laughs> he was all Ivy a year ago, and he more than likely is going to pick up that same designation again this season. Second down and 70 L at the 43. Whoops. Oh. And fumbled. Gavin O'Connor had intercepted. Then fumbled the ball and pouncing back on it. I don't know if Yale had pounced yeah, back on number 70 for Yale was Roger Anderson, the offensive tackle. Terrific offensive play. I've got to congratulate him for setting that play in. It was great scrambling by Stewart. He's going the opposite way and finds out that Gilmore and company are chasing him. So he's looking for a receiver on the other side of the field, and he finds him. Number 20, Gavin O'Connor for Penn, right? That's set up this way. He's tackled, goes down, he fumbles back into Yale's hands. I like the play calling. And it gets a first down for Yale at the same time. Even better. And McCauley squirts through, loses balance, it gets goes down at the 40. Gallagher tripping him up, and so he's got about two and a half, three yards to go for the first down. And we have Harvard now out in front of Princeton in the third quarter by a touchdown. And here's what the situation is here at Franklin Field in Philadelphia. And Yale really has to score, I think, on, on this possession, get some form of score, three or six. It's second down and down. four. Clock begins to become a factor. Second down and four at the 39. Spivak gets the call and takes it to the 45 and picks up the first down. Paul Spivak, the senior from New Haven, Connecticut, 5'9", 180-pound fullback for Yale. 12.54, the clock running down, remaining to be played in the football game. Penn with an 11-point lead, 24-13. You know, because Penn's offense hasn't really been on the field that much, and their scoring drives, their defense has had to play a lot. Yale's time of possession was 24-34 to 20-26. Just a moment ago, McCauley can't turn it up. And very quickly is Gilmore over there for Pennsylvania. 
79 Tom Gilmore is a guy I guess we ought to mention more we always mentioned uh, Bradley and Chambers but Gilmore is their best defensive lineman and the coaches feel their best pass rusher and today he might as well be a linebacker and numbers 93 is also doing a job out there Steve Pisano the defensive end he's right there with him second down and six at the 48 Hill with the football pressure Whoa. Stewart fires complete to Quinlivan at the 47 yard line of Penn that's short of the first down by about two yards Gavin O'Connor making the tackle Mark Quinlivan getting open as Stewart scrambles all over everywhere great escape he's chased by Gilmore again Gilmore might as well start on the other side of the line of scrimmage most times because he's there many times before the other people are he's been chasing Stewart all over the place but Stewart escaped again Ken Lund a sophomore checks into the Yale lineup and it's third down and two with the line of scrimmage the 47 of Penn Yale is six for 13 in third down conversions McCauley looks you see him look for the first down marker yep it depends on where they spotted he's on the line and if he's on the line it's a first down I don't know where he made it. If he put it on the other side, he doesn't make it. Bradley made a, a heck of a play from the backside again. Bradley was aware of that the first down marker was, too. Yep. Somebody's saying hello to you, Dick. And this is what will tell the story. No first down. That's how short. No first down. Three or four inches short of the first down. Well, you're trailing 24-13. There's 10.53 to play. Andy Marwidi checks in, number 33. This could very well be the game, even right though it's 10.53 right here. Yale is one for one in fourth down conversions this afternoon. They need less than a yard for the first down. Spivak is the lone back in the backfield. Spivak gets the call and on second effort picks up the first down. He did because he didn't make it the first time. He went right off the tail of number 71, Paul Weimer, and did not make the first down, but the second effort, Spivak made it. Peter Gallagher made the stop, finally. And Sean McDonough down on the sideline. Yes, Vic, we have an injury report. Number 66, John Krasowski, who came out of the game for Yale. Our report is that, is that he has a knee ligament sprain, and he will not be back in the game today. First down, Yale at the 43 of Penn. Marotta in motion. McCauley, staying low to the ground, takes it to the 35. George Lewis, the defensive end, number 94 in there, the senior from Pottstown, Pennsylvania, an economics major at Penn, making the tackle. It appears when McCauley, it appears that McCauley, when he's in there, really gives them something that they don't have with the other two tailbacks. He really has that quickness. He gets into the hole. Now you see the yardage situation. Two, yard, two yards needed. And he's in big trouble. Big trouble. Back to the 48 yard line. Instead of throwing the ball away, he kept hanging on. George Lewis in there with the pursuit. Lewis and Gilmore, as I said, Gilmore ought to line up on the other line of scrimmage. This time, Stewart's dropping straight back, but he is initially Dexter Desir beats his man, then comes Gilmore, and then comes Lewis. Lewis not only wants to wrap him up, but he wants to tie him. So it is now third and 18, and the fourth and one has been wasted. Picking up the first down on it. Line of scrimmage back at the 48. Here he comes. Gets it back to the 35. Picks up about 14. Dwayne Hewlett making the tackle on Stewart. I'll tell you, Dexter Desir, number 65, had him in his grasp, and somehow he got out of it. Here goes Stewart again. You see, number 65 has already beaten his man, Dexter Desir. He grabs him from behind, but somehow the great escape gets by, breaks two tackles. Is he back to the line of scrimmage yet? Uh -huh. Just about. We're right back of a fourth down situation. Fourth down and two. 
just where they started. Just where they started. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, fourth and two. Not in motion. McCauley and McCauley got that first down. He popped that hole real quick. Got a good block. Gavin O'Connor up there to make the final hit. Got a good block from 35. Dave Clive from the fullback position. Also, maybe Penn is so intent on coming on upfield, they just slipped inside them. But Clive 35 made the block to spring him loose. Yale's in a situation of needing two touchdowns in this ball game to do anything to pull the upset they would like. They trail 24-13 with 7.44 to play. First down at the 27 of Penn. Dave Klein inside the 25 to about the 23. And you have George Lewis again in there at the defensive end spot doing yeoman work the last couple series. See, the problem is, Dick, that they keep running time off that clock. Absolutely. They might score, but they're helping Penn because we're down inside eight minutes at 7.20. Uh, every time they've scored, they've had to, to eat a lot of time off the clock. You pointed that out very early in the ball game, too, Upton. Second down and six at the 23. Misdirection play with Luzzy. Luzzy. And he's down to about the 11-yard line and picks up another first down. Michael Luzzy. That stops the clock at 7.02 as the clock is stopped with the change of the state. Down in the sideline again, Sean McDonough. Some scores for around the nation. An upset in the making. Wisconsin leads Ohio State 16-7. That is in the fourth quarter. Boston College leads Rutgers in the fourth quarter 35-23. Georgia shutting out Kentucky in the fourth quarter 30-0. And it's Pitt 20 and TV 20. They are also in the fourth quarter. More in a moment. First down, Yale at the 12-yard line of Pennsylvania. McCauley, McCauley to the one, trying to stick it in there, but his knees had touched at the one. Lorenz made the final stop. Armstrong was also there around the ankles. Dave Klein again, number 35, made the key block to get him outside. I, I'll tell you, I don't know how they're doing it, but they are staying in the game. 6.30, though. Going to see number 35, Dave Klein. What's the key block in front of McCauley? Klein just clobbers his man, and McCauley keys off his block and gets down to the one-yard line. And Sean McDonough with some more scores. Fourth quarter is still Maryland 43, Duke 7. Also in the fourth quarter, TCU leads Baylor 28 to uh, 20. Oklahoma State ahead of Colorado 17 to 11 there in the third quarter. It's Michigan 20, Illinois 10. That's in the third quarter. Also in the third quarter, Clemson 35 and North Carolina State 31. Second quarter action, South Carolina 21, East Carolina 10. Georgia Tech leads Tennessee 14 to 13 in the second quarter. And it's still Army 13, Syracuse 10 in the second quarter. And the stakes were brought out. It's a first down for Yale, a first and goal to go from the two. Klein gets in. into the end zone. Touchdown, Dave Klein, Yale. That makes it 24-19. Steve Anders, 74, and Weimer, 71, right off that left side. Good blocking this time by McCauley, and they're right in it. Six Straight hand off the line. Straight hand off right off the left side, which was perfect. Bill Moore will be attempting the extra point. Moore's had himself a day, two field goals. And it's a fake, and Luzzi goes for two and makes two. Mike Luzzi on the fake extra point attempt ran in for the score. Well, you know, it's funny. I was going to say to you, why don't they go for two points? If they do, then they're within a field goal. If you don't, you still have to score a touchdown anyway. That makes it 24-21 now. And with 6-14 left to play in the football game. And Sean McDonough on the sidelines with... 
Dick, I don't know if I can hear you, but we do have Mike Curtin, the Yale quarterback here. Mike, you're jubilant after that big touchdown for your club. Uh, it looks good. You know, we got six minutes to go, and hopefully the defense will get the ball back for us. We can go down. You know, field goal ties and touchdown certainly wins it. We've been referring to your injury as a Charlie horse, but I guess that's not really what it is. Why don't you explain it to us? Uh, well, what they call it medically is a hematoma, which is basically a deep kind of inner thigh bruise. There's a lot of internal bleeding in there, and most of that uh, has gone away. It caused a lot of swelling initially, and it feels a lot better now. When will you be able to come back? I'll be playing next week against Cornell. Well, hopefully for your club, it'll be uh, with only one loss in the conference. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. That's Mike Curtin, the regular quarterback for Yale. He's a very interested observer here on the sideline. Bill Moore teeing it up. There's McCauley, who had some key runs in that drive. And Dave Klein, who did the blocking, got rewarded by getting the touchdown call. Well, and a good call by uh, a yell. And I, I must be surprised to see if they try an onside kick. Yeah, that they do. They try it. But it goes right into the hands of Dwayne Hewlett of Pennsylvania at the 47-yard line. But Dick, my question at this time in the game, plenty of time left, six minutes. Why do it now? Yeah, you may have a point. Steve because Bender's made the tackle. Penn has good field position, and Ben probably is going to keep the ball on the ground. Now try to eat up the clock, keep him away from the football. I'd much rather have them run the football and kick it down to the 10-yard line and give them good field position. John McGeehan is the man of the hour because he has the fortune of Penn on his shoulders, and he is 10 for 16, passing 196 yards, two touchdowns in the air, one interception on the day. Flag on the play. Flag on the play as the line of scrimmage gets beyond that line of scrimmage and into Yale territory to the 49. Ardell McKenna making the tackle. It's probably going to be Illegal Coach Yale. procedure on the blue. That's against Penn. A five yards will be marked off against the University of Pennsylvania. A thrilling ball game to watch if you have no rooting interest in this game. Well, especially in light of Penn's 17 to nothing lead, figure yes, that it was going to be a blowout, and Yale just kept hanging in there. Yale's defense did their job when they had to. Penalties in the ball game. Penn has five for 37 yards. First down and 15. Line of scrimmage for 42, and McGinn is going to sprint out and bat. The ball is batted by McGinn, almost intercepted by Keenan. He batted it up looking for the interception, but it just wouldn't fall right. Bob Keenan. I'm going to tell you something. John McGinn might have saved the game for Penn because he had that ball, Keenan, in his grasp, and I think McGinn interfered with him. Now, McGinn faked to his right. The ball is knocked up in the air by number 81, Keenan. Keenan then tries to grab it, and McGeehan grabs his arm. That's interference. Second down and 15 at the 43 of Penn. 541 left to play. Penn leading by three, 24-21. Don't go away. Out quickly to Bueller. Bueller hit by Penders. And there's the five for the late hit. That was the dumbest play of the ball game. And he's going to get more. Zanuski, they might throw him out of the game. John will agree with me when he, if we were to talk to him later, he knows he should not have come in there then. Zanuski hit him, and then when the official came over, he said something to the official. This could be the, really a crucial penalty now because they're going to walk off 15 as we see McGeehan walking around, probably exhorting him to walk off 15 more. And he threw down his flag again. I'm just wondering whether they'll throw him out of the game. Two dead ball five personal gets the white. Well, that's better than any running back can do for you. 30 yards walked off. And maybe the football game. As Penn now has the first down at the 35-yard line instead of being with the football back up around the 40-something. Well, they got unsportsmanlike conduct, and then they got another one on top of it for Zaneski saying something to the official. Can't do it. I know it was in the heat of the moment, but Yale still has an opportunity to win or tie this ball game, and you don't want that happening to you. Back to the 20 after the second one was assessed, and that's where we are. First down at the 20. I've got to 
watch him. I'm not even going to watch the quarterback on this. I'm okay, going to watch him. Now uh, they blocked him out of the play. Double team. And Comizio to the 15-yard line. Another flag. With two flags. Two flags. Penders is really upset now. Lockwood down there. Armin Lockwood on the stop, number 40. Going against Penn. Put me on the offense. Isn't it ironic they usually do, though? There is Camizio, and here is Camizio. Going to toss to Camizio. It's a little bit high. Reading his block. You can see the clipping on Penders 46 right there. Probably was Bueller, the wide receiver that came back. You have to be careful on the crack back. The helmet must be in front. Look at Ardell McKenna, number 56 for Yale in the white. He's, he's a little just, upset. He's fired up and he's talking to his teammates and, you know, urging them out. It's first and 25 now. 35-yard line is the line of scrimmage, 34 of Yale. It's a 24-21 ball game. Penn leading by three. Penn, of course, undefeated in Ivy League play. Four and one overall. And here's the misdirection play, and that's Camizio. Ankle tackle to save the touchdown, Bob Dooley. Bob Dooley. If it were not for that, there'd be another six up on the board for Penn. That's why that misdirection play gets a very catches a very aggressive team. You're really actually going against the grain. The flow is one way, and you send the back Camizio in this case back the other way. And I guess Penn's getting ready to kick a field goal if they don't get another first down. Well, it's only second down. Second down and 17. Line of scrimmage is the 27-yard line. Misdirection again, and Camizio hit behind the line of scrimmage to see on the bottom. That's Ardell McKenna. Ardell McKenna on the bottom. And Zineski. Number 56 and Zineski right around it. This time the direction is in the favor of Yale. Camizio coming back to the right side this time, but McKenna and Zineski right there. Can only do that a certain amount of time. Well, this now becomes the important play. Third down and 18. The line of scrimmage, a 28-yard line. Then is four for eight in third down conversions. Bueller in motion. That's Pat Bueller. They're coming too. Real pressure. Now he gets away. Gets the pass off. Incomplete. Incomplete at the 11 yard line. And you know something? This is not going to be an easy field goal to kick either. Pat Bueller was the intended receiver. Pressure is covered. Pressure is the name of the game. McKeon wants to throw. He's going to roll to his left. He thinks he has Bueller open, and he does just for a second. But the ball is delivered too low, and it bounces off his chest. Now the all-important field goal. This will be a 45-yard field goal attempt. 45-yard field goal attempt. Murphy has a 36-yarder this afternoon and three extra points. Got the distance. And right through. see it with 11 16 having gone by in this fourth and final quarter and now it is Yale needing a touchdown so what not a really field goal to tie no but what they've really done is offset the two-point conversion by Yale right and that's right it's, it's a touchdown wins the game for Yale plenty of time left on the clock and I wonder again Dick going back you try to remember key things in a football game that wins or loses it for you and that onside kick has to be the first thing in my mind, with all that time left on the clock, and the second thing has to be the back-to-back -back penalties on Zineski. And then the, right back to the first quarter up, then when Yale recovered two fumbles of Pennsylvania in their territory and couldn't come up with a point. But in spite of that, you just wonder what, what the thinking was uh, of the onside kick at that time and giving Penn good field position. There's three minutes and 44 seconds left to play. Luzzi's one deep man, and McCauley is the other. And this... They're going to boom it to the end zone, and Luzzy takes it there. Luzzy gets it across the 20 to the 24-yard line, and Yale has 76 yards to go for an yeah, upset. They do, and, and here's what you have to look for. Penn is going to be playing deeper than the deepest. They're going to give you everything short, and what you hope to have to do 
is that your quarterback can keep throwing underneath that defense and move it down quickly but efficiently a little bit at a time. Don't try for the home run. They're not going to give it to you. First down at the 23-yard line for Yale. The game is 27-21 Penn. And Stewart gets mauled. Gets the ball away. Throw the flag for intentional grounding, probably. Gilmore had him smothered. Well, Stewart, Stewart trying to argue from yeah. the ground, but there's no intended receiver, evidently. Well, and look I don't at know Carm about Koza. that. I, I think I'm on Carm Koza's side. We'll <laughs> see it on the replay. Fakes to the fullback and the tailback. The receiver coming by. But Gilmore has also beaten his man. Gilmore's taking him down. He's getting rid of the ball. The rule, as I understand it, reads somebody has to be near the ball. We really couldn't see off that replay. He's calling intentional grounding. But it wasn't until Gilmore started to complain that he threw the flag. I don't blame Gilmore, by the way. Very seldom see Carm Koza argue about anything in a football game. He came flying down that sideline to have it out with the official on the sideline. Intentional grounding. Lost him down. Second down. Now, I thought there was somebody near the ball, and that's all you have to have is somebody near the ball. Second down and 23. Line of scrimmage, the 10-yard line. They're off. Quinlevin, number 14, is offside. That second time, he's moved. That's for Yale, number 14. Mark Quinlevin is offside. Dead ball. Offense, procedure. So the line of scrimmage becomes the five-yard line. So what was an outside possibility? Dead ball, procedure on the offense. For Yale has just about now become an insurmountable hope. They are 95 yards away from the Penn goal line. And Eugene Prophet is in the game. Stewart gets the pass away, but of course it's incomplete. Prophet, who has not seen any action this afternoon, number 88, is the fastest player on the Yale football team. He also has his, his left hand, I believe, his tape. Remember back to the uh, Dartmouth game two weeks ago, he had two fumbles on the kickoffs because of that sore hand. He has had had surgery on that thumb corrective surgery for an injury and it's hampered him all season long. Marwidi checks into the Yale lineup number 33. It is third down and 28 for Yale from the five yard line and of course any kind of a mistake here and Penn picks it off as another quick six. 27 21 Penn leading 325 to play. Going downtown for profit but not enough. Uh, Ross Armstrong back there picks it off for the interception. This is what you call heaving it up there and hoping that somebody can catch it. You're just hoping that Ross Armstrong, who plays the middle of the field as well as anybody and is a terrific athlete, number 41, doesn't get to the ball, but he did. 317 to play, Penn leading 27-21, and now just consume it if they can. But there's Ortman with a lot of room. Ortman. Bob Dooley brings him down. Bob Dooley saved the touchdown momentarily. Steve Ortman is really their best outside threat. He follows the block off his fullback, gets to the outside. Change of direction here. Trying to set it up so Bueller would give him a block. And he's chased out of bounds. Ortman again, a fine run, breaking it to the outside. First down, Penn at the 23 of Yale. Ortman has 76 yards rushing on 13 carries. There's Stan Cost, the full back to the 20. Picks up about three. It'll be second and seven. Carmen Alacqua on the stop. They can actually run the clock down and kick another field goal and it's goodbye. I'm sure that's the game plan here. 2.30, the clock running down. Penn was a two-touchdown favorite in this football game coming in. 
Second down and seven at the 20. Camizio, gang tackle. A Lockwood, Lebissier meets him first. Everybody else follows up. One thing, Dick, at the end of a ball game like this, you, you want your backs to stay in bounds. You don't want them to be running out of bounds because then you're giving the other team almost a free timeout. This way, they're going to have to begin using up their timeouts. They've already used one with the quarterback when he came out and did See number 73 there up, not to cut you off, but he's wearing a shoulder harness. He cannot lift his arm above. He can't lift it halfway up. He had a very severe shoulder separation. He's playing with a special harness. Well, he's going out of the game now. I wonder if he hurt himself again. We have a third down and seven coming up, and in third down conversions this afternoon, Pennsylvania's had ten of them. They've completed five. 2.03, the clock is stopped. I would think that they just want to get themselves to the middle of the field, get themselves in a good position to kick the field goal, run the clock down, 2.03 left. Two excellent kickers in this ballgame, field goal kickers. Each one of them has done what has been called upon him to do this afternoon. Well, Murphy kicked the, the really the crucial field goal for Penn. That took a lot of pressure off when he kicked that and made it a six-point game again. Well, I think Moore also, in the fact that he had no attempts this season until this afternoon, made his first one even more important than it was normally. Third down and six, ball at the 19 of Yale. Penn in possession with a six-point lead. Pat Bueller in motion. Out to Ortman. And Ortman has nothing but grass in front of him. Touchdown, Penn. <laughs> Bueller got a good block from number 56, the center, Joe Smallis, who got out in front of the play. Just when you're expecting him to run it, they didn't. He just cleared it over the linebacker, rest number 49 to Ortman, who took it out in the flat and raced into the end zone untouched by number 56, two in front of him, the center for Penn. Joe Schmalis, you'll see him. He's the last guy to make the block as Ortman goes into the end zone. Really a, a good call because everybody was looking for something into the line. Tom uh, Murphy looking for his fourth extra point attempt of the afternoon, and he gets it. And so the score is now the University of Pennsylvania 34 and Yale 21. And it looks like Penn is going to remain undefeated in Ivy League play and also at the same time pick up their fifth win of the season. Steve Ortman. One more time we're going to take a look at Steve Ortman. A fine call by the Penn coaching staff. He's dropping straight back. He lets Ortman clear the linebacker rush, get out into the flat. He's got two people in front of him, led by the center, number 56. Watch the way he blocks on this play out in front of Ortman. He knocks down the last man with a shot at him. Tom Kitkavich. This is what a homecoming game is supposed to be all about, right? This kind of excitement, plenty of thrills. And there's the story. McGeehan, 222 yards passing as Murphy kicks off. And Stewart, he does everything. He's going backwards the wrong direction. And he fumbles, and Penn gets the ball. <laughs> The great escape has turned the other way. Bruce Rodeo, senior from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, pounces on the football. A wild Rodeo found himself the biggest moment in his life, number 38. Stewart thought he was taking the ball from the line of scrimmage again and passing because he tried the reverse just one too many times. We'll see it on the replay. He sees that he can't get to his right. He starts back to his left. Stiff arms one guy, begins to trip, turns around and said, I got to get rid of this ball, and he does. Just watch it right there. He's hit, and there comes Rodeo, number 38. Now Penn. With the ball on the nine-yard line, and a first and goal to go. They 
fumbled, and they fumbled. Penn fumbled the ball on the snap. His Linky, Helinski is in at quarterback. First time this afternoon for Penn. Chris Helinski, a senior from Bluebell, Pennsylvania. A minute 23, and the clock running down. Penn with the ball on the nine-yard line of Yale. Penn leading 34-21. McKenna there to make the tackle. I think they just want to run the clock out. I would think so. Why, why try to score? I mean, I know you have some young kids in there, but the damage is done. The game's running itself down. Just run the clock out. Look at Carmen Alaco on the far side of the field. Just laid his heart out injured and Slams his helmet down. Another fumble. Another snap problem. That should about do it, I guess. Clock is at 22 and running down. So with no stoppage, no next play will get off, I would assume. And Jerry Burton is University of Pennsylvania Quakers. Sit on top of that Ivy League. And their quest for a third straight Ivy League championship. Wasn't easy today. <laughs> Not at all. Should have been, but it wasn't. <laughs> That's the end of the football game. Jerry, great win for you against a very tough Yale club. They were, they were, I told everybody, they were a good football team and they played very well today. We beat a good football team. I'm proud of our kids. Looking down the road, you got some tough road ahead. Princeton coming up, Harvard as well. Absolutely. We'll, we'll have to play better than we played today, but they played well. Give Leo credit. They played very well. Well, your club played well, as, uh, very well indeed, and we know you want to get over and shake hands with Carver. Congratulations. We'll see you down the road. Thank you. I'm excited about today. Thank okay. you. Jerry Byrne, he was in a real rush, wanted to get over and see his good friend, Carm Coza, and he's a true gentleman. We didn't want to hold him up. Let's go back to the booth. Well, there you see the meeting at the midfield to shake hands, and it has to be... Uh, I, I'm going to use the word heartbroken farm closer because they were, they were in it. And the, the whole reflection of this ball game from their point of view is going to unfortunately fall upon the back-to-back -back penalties and maybe negate what was a real super effort. Well, I think it against did. Against a super Penn football I, team. I think it was a super effort. I think that Penn let them back into the game, Dick. When they let them back in again, they took advantage of it. They did what they had to do. The only the only problem if you have to think about it overall is what about the onside kick with six minutes left in the game? That might have been the whole thing even more important than the penalties. And we certainly want to thank so many people who were associated in helping us this afternoon. The athletic director, Penn Charles Harris. The coach, Jerry Burnt. The sports information director, Herb Hartnett. The associate director, Carolyn Schley. Yale, the athletic director, Frank Ryan. The sports information director, Mark Curran. Coach Carm Coza. Steve Berezzi. Eileen Hickey. Our spotter today, Donna Witzleven, and we thank her very, very much. Assistant for the statistics, Dave Evangelista, and our field helpers, Tony Malik, Karen Pingar, Victor Castor. And to those people, we thank you very, very much. And it's been a super football game here that we have seen at Franklin Field in Pennsylvania. Dick Galliott for Upton Bell and Sean McDonough wishing you all a very pleasant good afternoon, everybody, from Franklin Field in Philadelphia. Ivy League football is brought to you by the Travelers. People responsive to people with insurance and financial service needs. The Travelers, where fairness is good business. GTE, the company whose products include both microwave and satellite communication systems around the world. American Brands, Inc., a group of related packaged goods and service companies whose brand names have become household bywords. American Express. Cards, traveler's checks, and vacation stores. American Express. Don't leave home without us. The producer of Ivy League football is Greg Harney. Director, Ralph Molay. Coordinating producer, Gil Kerr. Associate producer, Pauline McCants. Engineer in charge, Bronislaw Kroll.
This program was produced by Greg Hardy Productions Incorporated in association with Trans World International.